Okay, folks, here we are. It's week four. Um, just to kind of give you a recap this morning, uh, it is uh, quarter after four in the morning. Um, my five-year-old is going to go back to school today. So um, uh, at the end of last week, there was we had confirmed more cases at daycare. Um, moms, I know, daycare can't tell us. The other moms told me. Um, and we just had a hard time physically plopping them into the hands of someone that we know was holding a child with COVID last week. Very entitled and privileged position to be in. Um, being a mom during all of this is absolutely wild. Every day is a, a crazy set of choices. Anyway, we're sending the five-year-old to school. The three-year-old is not yet going back to daycare. Um, all of it's irrelevant because most likely tomorrow will be canceled because of a snowstorm. <clears throat> um, all this to say, um, I do understand that I'm not the only one kind of going through a crazy time right now. Um, several of you have sent me personal messages um, of support, and I just got to say I've been blown away by that. Um, the fact that you'd stop to think of me when I know that all of you must be just so overwhelmed. I cannot imagine being a student during all of this in university. Um, I feel like I say this every lecture, but it's it's just so true that like I cannot, I'm, I can't believe what you guys are handling and it's just really, really, really impressive. Um, I'm really sorry, but this week is another really boring lecture. Um, last week was all the, the uh, lists. This week is all of the images. So um, I'm gonna try to make it interesting with um, some, some stories from my work experience or other stories from other people I've heard. Um, I've broken it into five separate PowerPoint presentations. Um, uh, so um, you can kind of manage it a little bit. I'll probably do it as one long video. Um, I might not, I haven't decided yet. Um, Regardless, the assignment mentions five separate videos, but I'm talking about, you'll see the five separate videos listed as the five different PowerPoint presentations. Even if the video is all one, um, you'll understand what I mean. I do want to point out that there's very little math in this week's, but in the foundations segment, we do do some math. We do um, like two, maybe three examples um, of calculations. Um, and I'm wondering if some of that should be bumped to the end. No, because I think your assignment actually covers some of that in it. So we'll, we'll stick with the exact outline that we have. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the first module is the steel images. So for those of you, uh, kind of co-looking at your assignment. This is the what we would start as the steel video now. Okay, so these really are a series of images I found on the internet. Um, I mean, I have a lot of uh, pictures from, from sites, but it's surprisingly hard to kind of gather up um, a random photo here and a random photo there from 20 years in the industry. Um, so most of these are from the internet. Um, I am trying to give the backstory for a lot of them, but most of them are just images of construction, so it's not so bad. All right, here is what we would probably think is the most ubiquitous style of construction. Now, there's a little bit of extra going on here. They have some stuff happening in it, but for the most part, it's pretty normal construction on site. So we have um, metal deck. So you can see the metal deck, the flutes are spanning that way. And I don't know if we can see it. I don't know if we can see any seams in the deck, but this piece of deck is quite long. So it's a long piece of deck. But look at these, look at these kind of funny little pop marks right here in the deck. Those are where they've been welded from above to the beams below. You can see the mirror of that in the ceiling, where this is one continuous piece of deck, but it's supported every so often. And if 
I pull out my piece of paper example, this is one long piece of deck and it has a series of supports. So there's a support here and here and here and here and here. So we say that the deck is spanning in this direction and these beams are spanning in this direction. Now here's where it gets interesting. Do you remember we talked about coming across um, a river in uh, the woods? And is it a beam? Is it a, or is it a stream? Is it a creek? Is it a brook or is it a river? Well, we have that same thing here. These up in the ceiling are all a series of steel beams. What we have here those beams that are really just supporting metal deck and happen very regularly, those are our purlins. Purlins are beams, so it's like you come across the body of water in the, in the running water in the woods, it's still a river, but when you look at it in the hierarchy of the whole, we would designate those particular beams as purlins or we would refer to them as purlins. We might refer to them as beams, but there's going to be a time next week where it's important to us to understand that this is in fact a purlin beam. So these ones that happen regularly supporting deck are the purlins. These major ones that are so, these purlins run in this direction. So the deck ran in this direction, the purlins run in the opposite direction. The major beams or the, the regular beams usually support the purlins. Now, you could replace these purlins with open web steel joists. That happens very often. These are beams. And we're going to talk about this all again next week when we talk about sizing guidelines. So, deck, purlin, major beam. Columns, I think, are pretty obvious. And then back here in the background, we've got bracing. That would be our lateral load resisting system. You can see we've got some openings in the deck that they have temporary hoarding around. Um, this deck here is probably going to have concrete topping put on it. So you wouldn't want to walk around on these flutes. You'd break an ankle. On a roof, they'll often just put a piece of plywood on top of that. But you want to know how I know, looking at this image, that uh, they're actually going to pour concrete on it see that they've left these kind of weird studs sticking up? Well, those are gonna get hidden within the concrete. And, often, and sometimes we can actually do something with those as well. All right, here's a very similar system. We can see our metal deck running in that direction. So there's our metal deck. We can see that there's um, beams back here that, they're being, that um, these elements are being supported by. But the thing actually picking up the deck isn't purlins, but open web steel joists. So O-W-S-J, open web steel joists. So we have our deck running this way, our open web steel joists running this way instead of purlins. Um, and then those are supported by beams. So we often just interchange with purlins and open web steel joists. Um, we'll often use open web steel joists if we have a lot of the same member. It makes things very cheap. They are made by a supplier, which means that um, there's a cost associated kind of in the ownership of the information. There's a lot more fabrication work in making them than just simply cutting a beam to length. So <clears throat> that makes them, that can make them very expensive to only order one or two. You get your cost savings in buying, I don't know, 200 of them. Somewhere in between two and 200 is where you're gonna um, decide to use an open web steel joist. What I might do on a given project is have open web steel joists in all of the normal spots. And then maybe there's a few little finicky spots where I'll use purlins, which are really easy to customize. So here's a metal deck, really heavy duty open web steel joists. And then these are going to trusses. So all of these elements are bending elements. 
And these were all ones intuitively that we know if you stood in the middle, you would make its shape go like that. You would cause it to deform or you would deflect its shape in some way. It wouldn't move off in space. It's stable, but it would deform by bowing in the middle or putting the top cord in compression and the bottom cord in tension. Let me pull out my foam block. So, top cord in compression, bottom cord in tension. Um, but they're all simple bending members. Even the metal DAC is a bending member. We have, um, instead of purlins or regular open web steel joists, we have some heavy duty open web steel joists. Um, and then instead of a major beam, we have what looks to be a major truss here. So remember that other picture I said I was pretty sure they were gonna end up putting concrete on it? Here's one that's gone a stage further. Look at this, there's also reinforcing on top of this deck. They put rebar in. You can see that, well maybe, Yep, you can see this is a line of uh, either purlins or open web steel joists underneath it. And you can see those little studs welded down through the beam as well. The welded wire mesh in this, or this is fine filigree of reinforcing, isn't structural. Um, I'll often get kind of questions from that by the architect kind of during construction often um, uh, and what they need to do with that. But this is pretty standard, not for structural reasons, but for crack control. So this is a thing to get in your head. And I'll say it again in the concrete slides, concrete cracks. Always, 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 you should understand it and your client desperately needs to understand it. One of the top things that people get sued by about isn't life safety issues, but serviceability issues. So uh, does their finish crack? So does that mean like um, drywall and plaster crack? But also concrete cracks, because people understand concrete structural and they look at it, they see a crack and they assume there must be something wrong with it. Um, pretty much every single project I have, I get an email about cracked concrete. Um, usually it's no big deal and it's usually the architect just saying, hey, I wanna make sure this is all right. But it is, it cracks. It has to crack. It's a nature of how it functions. Um, and we do things to um, help control the cracks. We can't stop the cracking. Um, but if we, if we say, I think it's um, a millimeter, I can't remember the exact amount. Um, so when concrete cures, it shrinks a little bit. Um, and that's when the, the cracks develop. Um, oh, forget the rule of thumb for how how much it is it's not uh, it's it's a millimeter every so often and I can't I can't think of exactly what it is but basically the crack controlling um, instead of having one large crack in one spot we have a multiple little cracks spread over the distance um, and we do that by having the crack hit reinforcing. Um, and then so a new crack might start somewhere else. Um, and so that's why we call it crack control reinforcing. And most concrete has that. All right, here are some of those studs getting installed on metal deck. Um, we'll often do this, um, I mean, this is how they connect um, uh, metal deck to steel beams that they basically take this gun, they stand on the roof and they shoot it down and it basically hot weld fuses um, this to the steel beam below. Sometimes it's a mag weld, but um, basically it fuses this stud through the deck onto the steel beam below. These studs can make the concrete that's gonna get poured here act compositely with the steel beam below. Now, composite is something we're not going to talk about until one of the last lectures of Structures 2. So don't worry about it too much, but if you feel like it, look up the term composite. Basically, we force them to act together in a really cool way. Um, so instead of, let me get my big fat pen here. So, if this, 
this is our steel beam and metal deck. So remember the metal deck is running across the top of the, so this is, see I said beam, but I mean purlin. We use the, the terms interchangeably. I'm talking about a specific bend, I'm talking about any old bending member now, so I'm using the term beam. If I was looking at a specific problem, I would probably call this a purlin. And so what we do when we make a composite, instead of just having this steel beam be this working for us in bending, by putting these studs into the concrete, we'll say some portion of that concrete topping is now also working for us structurally. So, you know, we get a little bit extra by making the concrete work. And remember, concrete's really good in compression. And if this is a bending member, look at that. All of the compression's happening at the top. Steel's great in tension. So the bottom cord of the steel beam is the one in tension. <clears throat> hollow core. We're going to talk about hollow core. We're going to look at it again in the concrete one. But concrete's handy to show uh, in the steel lecture because it often goes with the steel. Um, these are four foot wide panels that are, re they can be really, really long, um, but they tend to be supported on multiple beams. This gets rid of the deck and the open web steel joists or purlins. So instead, it's kind of like we have a series of small beams close together. So this is our hollow core that we're looking at. That is a beam. And then you can see there's another one of those directly beside it and directly beside that. So instead of having this thin little metal deck that can only take a, so much load in between those open web steel joists, um, we get rid of those two things and replace it with one element spanning in the direction that the purlins or open web steel joists would have previously spanned. You can see it's supported on steel. You all often hear people talk about hollow core, and one of the great things about hollow core is that you can run your mechanical system through it. That is crock. Do not believe that that's something you can do easily. Um, the only projects I've ever seen that happen, and I didn't do them, um, were ones that were very basic, had heavy mechanical systems, and needed almost no structure in them. Because um, look what happens often. That's grout. Can you imagine? Um, uh, and so what they have to do is when they connect panels together. So if this panel, this is actually where the beam was, and there was two panels kind of connecting to each other there, they have to put a piece of rebar there. So they take a sledgehammer, they bash out a little bit of that, drop a piece of rebar in, and then pour grout in it just locally, not very far. But if you're trying to run your mechanical system through that, it's gonna be very difficult. Um, <clears throat> here's concrete cast on top of steel. So there would have been a form here that got taken away. This is not a thing that easily and normally gets done. We don't like mixing um, trades that rely on each other uh, in sequence. So the metal deck option, you can put the metal deck down, walk around on it, and then the concrete people can just come and place it. There's very little work to do with it. The formwork's already there. This system, they had to put the steel up, put the formwork up, cast the concrete, come back, strip the forms, and then start um, using the flooring. Um, uh, so <clears throat> basically, they've gotten the worst of both of uh, steel and concrete here. You know, remember steel has the long lead time but gets installed quickly, but concrete has a short lead time and gets installed slowly. Well, this system has a long lead time and gets installed slowly. There would have to be a really good reason to do this. I don't, obviously it happens sometimes, but that is certainly not precedent. That isn't where you would start. 
So these are these I like to show. Um, they almost never happen here uh, in um, North America. Um, remember, I said. Um, well, actually, every I don't know five years or so, the people that rep these products come in and give lectures to everyone, um, and they tell us how great it is, and we look into it. And it ends up being priced out of the project. So the goal here is that, remember when I showed you this image? Actually, it's better on its side for this one. You can see that the top squishes and the bottom stretches. And that pink line in the middle, <clears throat> it's moving, like it's deformed, but its length hasn't really changed. There's almost nothing happening at the center of the beam. All the work is happening at the top and the bottom. Uh, so trying to take out some material in the middle is great. Take out material, you lower the cost, right? Um, except that the way they fabricate these is um, they are often... This is a top and bottom cord. They are often a steel beam that looks like that, that they torch weld or weld in, or cut, like cut in, maybe they laser cut it in some way, take those two pieces, shift them, and then weld them where they match back up. So it's usually not a beam that's had this cut out. It's usually two pieces that have been welded up along here. So that means labor is intensive to save a little bit of material. In our market here in North America, that isn't what governs our construction industry. We're governed by the cost of labor. We don't, we, we like to save material and where the labor cost is um, the same, we do everything we can to save on material because that's gonna make our project cheaper. Um, but if we have to add a ton of labor to it, we're not going to do that. So for us, the open web steel joists are actually going to be a cheaper option here in North America. Where I did see this is um, up until recently, I was doing my master's um, in tensile fabric structures in Germany. Um, and then and then we had a, babe, a second baby uh, and then COVID hit. Um, and because of COVID, they've actually canceled the program. But um, where uh, it, the, the school was, was actually Bauhaus. And they have like a technical uh, institute tied with it. Um, but obviously very focused on design. So it was really cool to kind of be at Bauhaus, but in some of the newer buildings that were built in the 80s and 90s, they had this construction. Now, if you know where our Bauhaus is, um, it is actually in East Germany. East Germany had um, a broken economy uh, when these buildings were built, which means that labor was cheap and material was expensive. So anything that could save on material, even if it put a ton of labor on it, was worth it. And so the one place I've seen this style of construction is where that was what was governing the market at the time it was constructed. If you're looking at how many slides we have to go through uh, and that I'm only on slide 10 uh, in this lecture, yes, there are a lot of slides, but they start to speed up because I'm trying to give you as much information right now early on. This is kooky weird. This is a nutty, nutty system. Um, we usually don't run these beams on top of these beams. This is unusual. Inevitably, next year, one of you is going to draw your studio project this way, but this is not what's normal. Normally for steel, we connect into the side of each other. We break it and connect it. Uh, this would be considered very, very, very unusual. My guess is, is they probably had mechanical issues of some sort and they could handle these lower bulkheads. Again, I can't, um, I can't comment on it, but they needed to um, put some little stubs in here of some sort. Okay, again, I said we wouldn't mix steel and concrete 
uh, as our major um, uh, construction element. So here we have a concrete column with steel and metal deck. I don't know what governed it in this project, but it does look to me like this is a mezzanine. Often what I see happen, especially with some of those condos or uh, major construction sites in downtown Toronto, is they build their floor plan. Um, sometimes they have a major um, kind of um, advertiser in mind, um, but often they just have this at the ground floor, one big huge section that they sell the rights to. And usually that goes with having a big um, ad up on the top of the building. Um, and often what they'll do is say, okay, you can do what you want here. There's limits to the loads. Um, you can't exceed these capacities. Um, and then they'll hire their own architect and their own construction team. So the building's built um, and now finishes are going in. And then this team comes in and does a small element inside the building. And so often those are mezzanines um, and they're simple, smaller construction within the confines of the bigger building. And my guess is that's what this was. Um, it's still not the norm. I've definitely done this in concrete buildings, um, but it wouldn't be where you'd start. If this was all new construction, you'd do all the same method of construction. Open web steel joist <clears throat> where it comes into a concrete wall. So uh, look at this, we've got a little angle that's been anchored into the concrete. And then um, look at this, see these slots here? So these are um, uh, horizontally slotted connections, not vertically slotted, because if it was vertically slotted, we wouldn't be able to hold this up. Actually, it looks like they might have vertically slotted these and then tack welded them on. Um, but this does two things. It gives them some play when installing it. Because you can imagine this concrete wall can't move, which means this dimension is set when they anchor it in. And the open web steel joist length is set. And we do a really, they do a really good job of trying to make sure that's exact. But if there was some tolerance issues and this was off, this was a perfect hole, and we were off by two millimeters, that bolt wouldn't be able to drop through that hole. So they'll often maybe oversize or slot those holes to give them that extra little bit of play. In this direction, it's actually fine to have that because we're gonna spend a lot of time later in the term talking about pinned roller connections and how we basically, in normal steel construction, get them for free. That's just how things get built and it's pretty handy because most it also eases the way we design members. For something like this where we're connecting into a concrete wall, it's a little bit harder to naturally get that pinned roller condition. It's not impossible. And here's one of the cheat ways or the easy ways we might force it to be a pin roller connection. Don't worry about pin roller too much right now. We're going to start talking about that in the second half of uh, the term. Gerber system. Gerber systems are really cool. They're not just it's not just that they're fun to say, uh, but you'll also hear often hear it called a Gerber girder system. Um, so what we can do, I have a bunch of printed off material here. Um, so a Gerber system So normally, what we would do is we would design four columns and three beams. I think you can get your head around that. That's pretty easy. What we haven't talked about is what moment moments look like. And we'll talk about this kind of later in the term as well. Um, so don't worry about this, but our moment diagrams, I'm, engineers tend to draw these moment diagrams upside down. Our moment diagram would look something like this. Don't worry, you don't know how to do that, but you will by later in the term. You will know how to figure out what those green, green arcs are and what the value is of them. A Gerber system does this. So we take these long beams and then we drop a little one in here in the middle. It's often how bridges are built. They kind of start from the two sides and meet with a piece they drop in in the middle. 
it changes our moment diagrams. Um, so we'll end up something like this instead. I hear people awake. I hope that's Dave and not a child. Um, and so uh, we've lowered our moment value. Now, again, like I said, you don't know how to do that yet, so don't worry about it. I'm not expecting you to know that. Um, but um, if we can lower the value of the moment, we can probably use smaller beams. It also means that this beam right here gets very small. And so overall, we can really lower the cost of the system. But it only works if it's repetitive and it's something we can do again and again and again. Um, so it's not the place we normally start. It's really good in industrial buildings. Um, uh, so it's not something that's often used, but when we do, it's really handy and really smart and in an engineering way. Okay, holes in beams. So we're gonna start to get faster at some of these things. I can feel I have to sneeze. Ugh. So holes in beams. Um, what are, uh, it was just Dave and not a small child, thankfully. Um, he, they can't see you, the cameras. He's just got crazy hair right now. Um, a typical rule of thumb for when you don't need reinforcing, and usually when you don't need to talk to the engineer and you can just make some decisions. If that's the length of your beam and that's the depth of your beam, your opening can be in the middle third and the middle third. So we call it the middle third rule. The middle third of the length and the middle third of the depth. More than that, you might not be able to do it at all, but if you do, you probably need reinforcing. So you can see that they didn't just cut a hole here. They had to reinforce around it. So it's expensive and we try not to do it. We often try to go underneath. But sometimes you have no choice with some electrical or plumbing, some, something that has to happen in there. That's coffee. Um, so this one, there's so many holes in it, they actually built it up out of small elements of beams. Look, a top cord, a bottom cord, and little bits in the middle. This is what would actually be called a Virendale truss. Crazy openings in beams. Okay, we've got Z girts on top of uh, major beams here. Look at this, it's got a connection in the middle here. So this tells me that this is either an A-frame construction or um, uh, it's a Gerber system that just doesn't change the sizes. Um, but you can see that they've just got some bolts here connecting this together. But what I wanted to show you is these Z girts. These are, um, uh, like metal deck. They occur regularly over some spacing. They're usually not as strong as open web steel joists, so they're usually often spaced closer together. And they're usually proprietary by the um, supplier. It depends sometimes, so usually that's part of a cladding system. They will sometimes get lumped into the structural system periodically, often they're kind of outside of the structural engineer's scope. Um, and so there would be like a delineation here in scope. Um, but uh, sometimes, depending on specific cir circumstances, the Z-Girts might fall into the engineer's scope. You can do cool things with steel. It adds some cost. Um, but if you really want beautiful looking steel, you can do uh, really cool things. You can have um, really nice finishes on it. This particular one actually has castings in it. So this right here is a cast element because making these smooth transitions through welding things together is almost impossible. So this is a cast piece of steel. Um, and then these pipes for HSSs got welded to the casting and then it was all smoothed out. Some more architecturally exposed structural steel. This is Gold Ring Center for High Performance Sports that I was the uh, engineer for. You can see these columns are very much exposed. Now there are guidelines on architecturally exposed structural steel um, about kind of distance of viewing. Um, if you're gonna be this close to it, it needs to meet the highest kind of level of visual 
and tactile experience. But as it gets further away, you tend not to care as much. Um, so down here where you walked along the ramp, it had to meet a very high level of architectural exposure. Here where people were working out, it needed to meet the mid-level. And up here, eh, nobody really cared, you just kind of needed to see it at a distance. It could withstand the kind of visual uh, distance. Only problem is these were one continuous element and you didn't want kind of that, you, could, you would be able to notice the change in it. Now, if there was an element here and an element here and an element here, you could probably do them all at kind of different levels of uh, kind of visual inspection. Steel, if you're talking about um, fabricated elements, you can do cool things. So look at these. These small elements are easy to roll. So the smaller the element, the easier to roll it. And rolling means forcing a curve into it. A steel beam that was this deep wouldn't have been able to be curved or rolled to that degree. So by making it fabricated, you could really get some uh, curvature out of it by curving the bottom one and the top one independently and then welding them together. Okay, so here are some details. This is ubiquitous. This is common. This is normal. You can see our open web steel joist sits on top of our beam. Now normally you can see this beam, um, we don't have one with two beams just meeting into each other here, but normally I said, remember their tops are at the same level. The only time that's different is with an open web steel joist. The open web steel joist normally does sit four inches above the top of this beam. But that means when we have our purlin, if we made the tops the same height, there'd be a gap between the top of the beam and the open web steel joist next to it uh, and the underside of the metal deck. So if we have purlins that need to match the top height of an open web steel joist, we'll often raise them a little bit and cope them right here. This is not an expensive detail. Coping that is just, as long as you tell them it needs to be done, has almost no cost implication. And kind of then just here off into the corner, you can see a brace from a lateral load resisting system coming into the top of the beam and the column. You can do cool fabricated stuff and you can get some really cool detailing. Uh, long span steel joists. These, um, you can see there's a lot of them. Um, there's labor that goes into it, but if you're making a hundred of them that are the same, you kind of offset some of that cost. You can do really long span trusses. So these ones, look at the depth in these. What's really cool is doesn't it look like it's hollow here in the middle and they've got these temporary supports here? That's often how they'll build it. They'll make this a segment and this a segment and this a segment and they'll bring this in and temporarily support it, bring this in and temporarily support it, drop the middle in, fasten it all together and then take these elements out. So you can see this is a section here that's going to get brought into place. Here's the splice. We call where those connections happen, happen in the middle of the length of it. So this is the length or this is the length of our beam. This would be normal connections where it just sits on something. But if we put a connection in the middle of the bending element, we often call that a splice because when we put it back together, we need to make it act like one continuous element. Uh, you can do all kinds of uh, cool shapes. I often get a lot of people say, well, what's the name of this truss? Some of you next year are even going to get studio reviewers who get caught up on the names of trusses. I think the names of trusses are irrelevant. The math is the math and it works. We don't need to name it after some guy who died 100 years ago to know that the engineering works. Um, so I am certainly not gonna ask you to memorize the names of the trusses. That said, I came across this one recently and I thought it was absolutely hilarious. I have no idea why, but something about the triple whipple truss I just thought was fantastic. All right, here's a tubular space frame. So basically we have trusses kind of happening in multiple directions. Curved steel. 
uh, fireproofing. So remember I said steel um, is non-combustible, but it has a really poor fire rating. Well, the way we deal with that is we cover it up with something. Um, so if you have a high fire rating requirement and you're using steel, you will need to protect the steel in case of a fire. Certain drywalls can do that. So most gypsum wall boards, if they're fire rated ones, can protect your steel. But where you have um, uh, maybe, maybe this is where the tile ceiling drops down to and you're chasing mechanical elements through the top of this wall, you need to fireproof your steel then. Fireproofing um, is relatively cheap unless you're talking about intumescent paint. Intumescent paint, you've probably all seen, if you walked up to a steel element and it kind of has this orange peel texture to it, that's intumescent paint. And intumescent paint, if you light it on fire or it gets exposed to fire, it puffs out uh, hugely and at, basically creates insulation. Once it's been used, it has to be chipped off and replaced. Um, uh, but it's very, very, very expensive. Intumescent paint is more expensive than steel. Um, and sometimes just increasing the mass of the steel can help improve your fire rating. Um, so I've actually had projects where I've worked in conjunction with the code consultant to kind of um, uh, maximize or minimize the amount of intumescent paint required by thickening the element of the steel because that was actually cheaper than having a thicker coating of intumescent paint. Cool shapes. So these are all straight line elements, but you connect them together in a repeating connection and they form a dome. These are a series of curved frames that are superimposed on each other to make a grid. Um, this is a multi-story column. So look at this. This column comes in and then there's a break here that's discontinuous. And then we have another lift of column. This column and this column and this column could probably all have been designed separately. So they could probably have broken this and made this a smaller column even than this one because there's essentially going to be another story going to go on top of this. Um, and so we'll often start our design there. But then the fabricator will come in and say, hey, it's actually easier for us to do these columns in lifts. And that's a construction process. The engineer can't anticipate that, but it has an impact on the design. This is now a continuous column where we would have designed it as two um, single separate columns with a pinned connection here. You don't know what a pin means. You don't know what continuous means. I mean, you do, you have an idea that there's a difference there, but it changes the way the loads transfer between the two things. So sometimes, when the contractor does this, the engineer just has to go back and do a few checks. It usually doesn't have an impact on the design, but sometimes it can. Perimeter wind columns. So if these are our beams in bending, what happens when we have our column as the outside of the building and there's cladding on it? Well, the wind blows and it becomes a bending element as well as a compression element. <coughs> oh, excuse me. As well as a compression element. So these would be bending in this direction. I also might have to pause this. I, there's a chance that there's freezing rain and I have a low key anxiety. In about 45 minutes, they are gonna cancel school on the first day Malcolm's gone back. He's had one day of school since December 17th. Um, industrial building. These, again, these are, I just want you to have a quick reference, like when something stumps you, you can Google it, totally. But I've tried to put it with very specific titles, just so if you want to see how things go together, you can go back quickly and just see how they might kind of fit together with what you're trying to do. And be like, oh yeah, that's how I'd draw it. Uh, so these are wind columns. Um, and look at these ones. They're shaped funny. They're small here and thicker here at the middle. Um, well, when things are in bending, depth helps us. Remember that thing I said you didn't have to understand um, and it had that moment diagram and we're gonna figure those out later in the term. See how the moment is highest in the middle? Again, 
you're like, I don't know what that is and I don't know what that green bump is, but you can see in the middle of that beam is where it's the thickest or the deepest. That is our moment and moment usually gets solved by deepening the beam. We like our beam to be thicker or deeper where we have moment. And so in this wind column, thickening or widening or deepening the beam, making it have it more depth, I shouldn't use thicken and widen because those are gonna have specific references for us later. But the depth, I know it's turned on its side, but think of it, you know, think of it turned, turning your head and this would be like the floor here and this would be the underside if it was a beam. You can do built up elements. So this is a, a Mies van der Rohe with um, welded up columns here. Built up columns, I showed this in the unique detailing. Cruciform columns, very popular thing um, we see in construction. Um, what we do with a cruciform column and why they are very expensive is this is how they get built. There's one plate in the middle and then two side plates. And so you have to have <clears throat> four welds all the way along the length of that to kind of make them act together. Architecturally exposed columns, truss columns. You can even make the columns into trusses. Cool 3D truss columns with pinned bases. And so this is this is some place where we had to work hard to make our pin happen. Again, you don't know what a pin is. We're gonna talk about it later in the term. Cable stayed columns. So one of the reasons people like these is because you can barely see them from a distance. It makes it look very wispy. But when you're up close, obviously now you have a scattering of cables around this. Masts. Masts with cable stays. A truss mast. So again, I'm trying to fly through these now. These are the less common things, but I just wanted to show you some pictures. Okay, so a typical column base. The thing I can guarantee you is these anchors that get cast into the concrete will be wrong 60% of the time. The thing that I see wrong on site the most is this particular detail. Nobody's really come up with a cheaper, better way to do it. Um, one of the worst things is that they're usually only out by a little bit. Like if this was right here and this was right here, what do you do with the base? You don't want to move your column because that changes all your steel beams up, up above. It changes the, uh, the kind of regular patterning of your siding. So you can't just move your column a little bit. You have to fix that connection at the ground. You have to make your change happen there. Uh, a really heavy column base, unusual, very heavy column base with a brace coming into it. So uh, in compression, it's not a big deal. Our elements usually just sit on each other. For uplift though, our column wants to be pulled up and we have to connect it to this concrete. Um, so what we'll often do is take these long rods and embed them very, very, very far down into the concrete. Sometimes there's even a plate welded onto the bottom of that rod to try to grab as much concrete. You can imagine now if, uh, I'm gonna draw. Um, so this is, this is the top of our concrete there's our steel column, there's our base. Embedding these big rods into it, when that column has uplift on it, meaning there's a force trying to pull it up, what happens is those anchors means it engages all of that concrete. So it tries to lift up all of that concrete with it, which is usually enough weight to hold it down. Um, this particular column has moment on it. It needs a connection to the ground that isn't a pinned connection. We have to do something more there. Um, that usually means the base gets wider and we have big connections. Now, you don't know what that means. You don't know what these deep, you don't know what that moment is, but we will talk about what a moment connection is. 
thought I heard a child, um, later in the term. Here's just some steel in the shop. This is a cruciform with all kinds of welding on it. Uh, a steel arch bridge. So when we arch it, we get a little bit of benefit that we've turned these into compression elements, not just bending elements. But when that happens, we get a thrust at the base here. So now we have to deal with this kicking out force. And when it's a suspension bridge, we have the same thing that it's trying to pull it in. I gotta sneeze. Ugh. Sorry. <coughs> um, and so on the top of this mast or this pier, this cable is trying to pull this over. The way we balance it is by having it on the other side. Um, and so this comes down to something in the ground over here. Here's a, a lateral um, element. We have a, a diagonal tension or compression brace. So that's in the wall and that's what's stopping our building from racking. Some crazy detailing um, with diagonal elements at the base. Bracing coming into a column and beams. Now we're going to talk about lateral load resisting systems in a little bit. So this is just to show you, you'll see a lot of these same slides twice, just in two different categories so that you kind of have a quick reference for them. So these ones look a lot thinner. Intuitively, you know that um, these ones look quite chunky. These ones look quite, quite slender. Well, our wind can go in either direction. Um, and in compression, we have a funny problem. In tension, no big deal, but remember in compression, we have this weird buckling phenomenon that happens. Um, so if we have only a brace in one direction, it needs to work for tension loads and compression loads. If we do tension only braces, we need them in two directions. They don't have to be in the same bay, but we have to then design it for two different things. Um, but we can actually make them uh, more slender then. Eccentric, you're gonna have weird things happen if you need to. And in fact, in some systems, they've discovered that this is a great way to help dissipate energy. X-bracing using angles, so these would be tension only elements. X-bracing with channels. X-bracing with rods, so these are very, very slender. Um, uh, so they are definitely tension only elements. Very, uh, again, very slender X bracing with rods. Um, you can see that the detailing changes a little bit. A water tower with X bracing. So these things can start to work in 3D as well. Here's some kooky, unusual bracing. Um, uh, this is under construction, so I don't know what the final kind of layout is, but there's some weird stuff happening here. K or chevron bracing. Um, so you can see in one bay, we have a uh, kind of one that meets like this. Double chevron bracing. K or V bracing. Again, I don't care about the names. What I want you to understand is that these are lateral load resisting systems. I don't care what the name is, you should understand that they're braces um, and that that works with our steel system. If it's concrete, you should understand that it's a shear wall, most likely. Um, so you should be able to identify that that is the lateral load resisting system, um, but I'm not making you tell me what, what whether it's K bracing or V bracing. It's kind of like, what's the truss name? I don't actually care that much. This one's cool. This is super bracing. So look. Overall, we've got large bracing going up the building, but at this floor right here, we have a brace element here and a brace element here. At this floor, we have a brace element here and a brace element here. This is where it's important to understand detailing. In this one, guaranteed, they drew this as stick figure that looked like this. 
so I know it's drawn over my other drawing. Don't worry about that too much. Um, I try to get in the habit of always drawing my members with some depth or thickness so that you can start to get an idea that you've got a little more going on there. And I even try, and if you look at my gold ring drawings, you will see that we very much tried to do this. I often try to draw braces in as well, just to start to give the team an idea that it's going to be, there's going to be more stuff there than you think, which means if you're trying to plan doorways and where fireboxes go, um, that you understand that there's more structure than just that stick figure that we tend to draw. Um, you can combine steel and wood, but look at this. We come back to steel right here. So you're going to see this in the wood lecture and you're going to see this in the bracing lecture. But some component of it is still steel. An eccentric, jo jo eccentric bracing joint. Now these tend to be governed by seismic design. So this tends to be something that was put in there very explicitly bracing on a round structure. We tend to think of things in an orthogonal way, <clears throat> but we have to think about it in every direction. Um, I always joke that, or Dave and I both always joke that you can uh, take your pain once or you can spread it out a little bit. It's like taking off a band-aid. You can tear it off really fast or you can do it slowly. Um, so you can have a big, large brace or you can have smaller braces spread out. Here, they went to the extreme and had a filigree of braces spread out a lot. You can do really cool systems. These are, um, right, so this is 134 Peter, which is actually the office um, my husband works out of um, back in the day. They still have an office there. He always jokes that um, he spent more in rent for an empty building um, than our mortgage three times over during the pandemic. Um, so uh, these um, are cast nodes right here. That one node is uh, 30,000 pounds. So just to give you a sense of uh, the scale of this, those concrete castings are gigantic. They're bigger than a person. Um, and so these are very large steel columns and the welding happened for this in place on site. I have lag time videos of it that are really, really cool but you can start to do cool things. Now this isn't precedent. This took specialty engineering, um, specialty construction, a process that hadn't been done before. A framed arch or a three pinned arch. So here we have a frame that looks like this and a frame that looks like this and we lean them together and pin them at the top. So the same one that I showed you for openings, this is also a moment frame. You can see they've temporarily braced it um, in the other direction, um, but in this direction, it's a moment frame. Steel moment frame. See, these elements look big for whatever it's doing. We don't actually know what it's doing, but you can tell that these are bigger than you're used to seeing for what looks like a relatively small span. Your columns are certainly bigger. So moment frames we're going to talk about later in the term are uh, expensive. The elements are bigger and they're not as stiff. Um, so they are not the place we start. They're a last resort. A small moment frame, most likely going into the back of the Toronto special house. I always joke about this. Um, so if you've walked down the streets in Toronto, you have probably seen the street front, uh, that looks like this, you know, series of houses all in a row, um, that are very narrow in plan. They're very long narrow buildings like this but <clears throat> that's a long amount of wall but what happens if you tear those two buildings down you don't have much left and this wall is our lateral load resisting system for wind acting on the sides of these buildings you've got a real problem and the biggest thing that i see happen in toronto is people want to 
tear out that wall and put a little kitchen pop out on the back of their building. No problem, you do it to yourself. You've got a lot of wall there. But what happens when all of the neighbors do the exact same thing in plan and all of a sudden that wall that was your lateral load resisting system is removed. So what I often end up doing is putting one of these moment frames in place of that back wall. Okay, that's the end of the steel lecture. Um, I'm gonna pause this for a second and I'll jump back in with our next topic. Okay, now we're gonna start the wood video. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit faster. I'm gonna try to jump through this a bit because um, I do wanna make sure we get to the math questions before the end of the lecture. Um, um, uh, I, there may be a stop or two because I am trying to monitor if um, they cancel school today. Not so much for me, like they don't, they, schools will be open, I could drive my son, uh, but I have a friend who goes to work and their child would be at daycare and stuck without a bus to get to the school. Um, they're also the family that tested positive for COVID last week, so we have to figure out a way that I could help them out to get them, I mean, they don't now, they're allowed back at school, but it's still unnerving. Um, the five day isolation requirements are a little bit odd. Um, and we don't know if we had COVID because we never got a positive test. So uh, we're stuck in this weird spot where we had two weeks home isolating and we still don't even know if we had COVID. At the time we were sure we did, now we're not so sure. So it's very anxiety inducing. Um, if you see mothers weeping on the street, just you know, give them some space. Um, okay, so wood images. Um, in residential construction, it's kind of its own uh, beast. So these are kind of lumped together between residential and mass timber. Um, uh, just to kind of show you them. Mass timber usually follows a construction style similar to steel. Um, so if you see the big scale projects, we're talking mass timber. If you're seeing small scale lumber, we're talking uh, wood. Now again, these are all just reference trying to give you something to go back to. So you can see here, these are what we would call joists. In wood, we call our purlins joists, which I know is confusing because in steel, we call open web steel joists joists, and we call our purlins purlins, which are really beams it all gets very confusing. And technically the open web steel joists are beams, but they're truss beams. Engineers like to confuse everyone with terms, but they have meaning to us, I promise. Uh, these are all beams. These ones are joists because they're repetitive. And there's your major beam. Old construction, the principles are sound. We've been doing it for a long time. Here's a, um, a system of logs acting as the walls. Um, so every surface is the structure. Now we know how to make plywood. We do small elements regularly and then put a cladding system on it, which is our plywood. The plywood does some other things for us. Um, or maybe you did wood and you just infilled with something else to give you your kind of wind barrier or your, uh, your, um, uh, your cladding system. All right. I am not going through the steps of wood construction for you guys. What I'm trying to do is give you some resources for it. Um, we, I, that's why I amalgamated this. The idea is you're in this program because you know all this, but I know that that's not really fair because some of you haven't seen it. And if you did, you maybe learned it in a different language. Um, your local construction methods might be different. So I really don't think some of that is fair to you guys. So I've tried to put this together, even though it's technically outside of our, uh, kind of mandate in the course. All right, here's a simple deck. Here are our piers um, or our foundations locally. Here's a beam, here's a beam, here are joists. They're beams, these joists are beams, but you can see they're regular, regularly spaced, and we know that plywood or decking of some sort is gonna go on top, top of this. Here's an actual deck. A deck tends to be the simplest one to see all the things that are going on. Um, so you can see how long these things are so this is almost 17 feet and these are two equal distances with our foundations. Along here, there's a ledger, which is just a piece of wood that's anchored regularly to a concrete wall. These joists connect to that. 
this ends of the joists can connect to these beams. The beams are double two by eights. The joists, what do they say the joists are? Ah, two by eight joists, and then see this? 16 inches OC, 16 inches on center. If you see wood and it's the same member every 16 inches, it's a joist. Um, beams are always double elements. We're gonna talk a lot about some of this stuff next week as well. Uh, wood floor framing. So you can see it's the same idea as that deck, um, but now just inside. We have a concrete perimeter all the way around. We have a girder. They're calling this beam a girder. I don't know that I would call it a girder because these are my joists at 16 inches on center. Uh, I would probably just call this a beam. But again, we kind of change these things around a little bit. Uh, subfloor, which is our plywood. It's also gonna act as our diaphragm on upper floors. Here's a framed opening. Um, this is blocking down these lines. We like blocking um, because it stops lateral torsional block buckling. So here's our, our beam element. Remember I said things in compression buckle? Well, when we bend this, top cord in compression, bottom cord in tension, the top side in compression wants to buckle. And so we put blocking in because it doesn't take much to stop that from happening. Usually if Dave's here, I'll get him to put his finger on the side right there. And it takes almost nothing to stop that from buckling. Here's a view from below. <clears throat> Concrete wall. This one doesn't have a ledge. Well, maybe it is a ledger. It's hard to see if it sits on it or if this piece of wood is anchored into the concrete. Both are valid ways to do it. If you look at the typical details, you can see that both methods were provided as a standard detail in the wood section of the typical details. Girder or beam, floor framing. These ones are a slightly different looking thing, but we'll talk about eye joists next week with floor sheathing. Here's a stud wall. It's the same idea as our walls, but instead of a joist at 16 inches on center, we have a stud at 16 inches on center. There's a doorway in it, and we have king and jack posts or a door jam. There's all kinds of nomenclature that's specific to wood construction, and I don't always know all of it. Um, what I need you to know is that these are uh, studs and that we would usually put drywall over it if it's not a sheer wall and if it is a sheer wall we'd put plywood on it. Here's a stud wall. There's our opening. We've got a beam up here and a beam in here. We've got lots of elements here. Double stud wall. Less common. Um, I was surprised to find out that the addition to our house is actually double stud wall construction. Um, so double stud wall is interesting. Um, so wood is good thermally, um, but it's not as good as insulation. Um, and as we get better and better at um, uh, sealing our homes, um, the wood starts to become the weak point where heat can transfer out. Um, so in um, kind of newer homes that aren't like the maybe... 80s and 90s construction, if you look at a roof, you will see that the first place the frost disappears on a roof is at 16 inches on center because the heat's being lost through the joist. It's better than the spots, if there was no insulation in the spots adjacent to it, it would be the best spot in the roof. Uh, but where uh, we have insulation now, it becomes the weak point. And so in a double stud wall, what they do is they allow um, there to be insulation everywhere. So this is a cross section of that. You know, there's the uh, there's the outside wall, there's the inside wall, and we ought, we stagger our studs so that you can get insulation all the way through. And that's what the addition. Well, you can see it in my window. No, my window over there because you're looking at it in the mirror. So it's this weird kind of triple double thing happening. It's what's over this shoulder to you guys. Uh, but for me, I'm looking at it over there. 
So it's this weird addition that we have. Lintel. That is a beam that goes over a door or window. Why do we give it a special name? Well, because in wood construction, it doesn't necessarily happen at the floor level. Sometimes it's dropped down. This one's at the floor lintel, but sometimes they might be directly over the window. How do we connect wood to wood? Well, typically, this is the top of our joist and that's the top of our beam and we connect them with joist hangers. We can stack them. That's a different type of construction, but it's equally common. Less common now. It used to be how it was done. This tends to be common with the kind of development of these steel fasteners. So here's one where it's stacked. The beam is below and these joists are stacked on top of the beam. We overlap them and then block in between. Otherwise, these would want to tip over at the end. Here's um, a joist to a concrete wall. We've got our ledger that's connected to the concrete wall, and now we just put our uh, joist hangers onto that. Here are some images of joist hangers. You can put openings in eye joists. Again, middle third, middle third. I know these ones are deeper than the middle third of the depth of the joist. These are proprietary products and these would be designed by the engineer that stamps these shop drawings. Trusses, again, um, I just care that you know that these are wood roof trusses. These would happen every 16 inches the same way our joists would be. So they take the place of the joists. If you're imagining an open kind of roof area where you can have a loft, these don't do it. They make the construction very cheap. You can build it where you put an opening in here. Um, so this would be the bottom cord and then you would maybe do a small frame within this and leave an opening. I've seen that done a lot as well. So here are some roof trusses. Look at this, you can see these steel plates. What they often do is they're steel plates with like notches punched in them and then they get pressed together. So look at this, in the background you can see all of these trusses that look identical and then this one that's different. Inside, we don't care about what's happening in between those braced elements. In the last one, the one that goes over our exterior wall or the gable end of our building, we need to protect it from wood. We have a, need a place to put the plywood for the exterior of the building. So that's what we're gonna put our membrane on and our cladding. So these ones need bending studs to be able to take the plywood on the end. Um, you can do built up beams, so you can take multiple plies and screw them together. Um, you can put a splice in it so it can be longer than you and than you is your materials available. But look, there's this joint here. This member only has the capacity of two elements. Because of this joint here, it's not considered a continuous element. Built up beams. I feel like I should switch those two slides. Um, so here we have two ply three ply, four ply, two double ply. So this is, um, these are double width sections. So these would, this would be, maybe this is a two by eight, three by, so this is a, this is a two ply, two by eight, three ply, two by eight, four ply, two by eight. This would be a, uh, a two ply, four by eight. This starts to be less common. They have specific screw patterns, and if you look at the typical details, I gave you something on that, but it's not something you'd be that worried about. LVL beam. We're gonna talk about what LVL members are next week, um, but you can see they look slightly different than our normal wood elements. PSL, another engineered wood product. So we've got joists and we've got beams that look slightly different than normal wood. A flitch beam, these are expensive. They are not where we start with our construction. Um, but if you have a situation where the beam you need is too many plies and it's too wide, maybe it needs to fit in the wall and all the rest of your construction works, you don't wanna have to deepen the beam in one specific spot. And so it's a real conundrum, what do you do? 
well, maybe you add some steel plates and you narrow this up and now it fits in your wall where it's in the wall, but it's not too deep in the open area, for example. Glue lamb. So this would be mass timber. And so now we're not talking about residential construction. This would be similar to steel construction. So we've got a deck of some sort sitting on our uh, beams and connected to girders. Glue lamb's really cool because you can curve it in really steep curves. Remember I said the deeper it is, the harder to curve, and that's true, except glue lamb is really a series of shallow beams glued on top of each other. So you'd curve one, and then you'd curve another, and you'd curve all of them, and then you'd glue them together. So this is really two by construction. So these are two by sixes, or two by fours, or two by eights. Um, all stacked on top of each other. So next week we'll see some images of what, or um, we'll see some cross sections and do some work on how we would size those. Curved glue lamb. So this is um, CFB Borden's uh, cafeteria. Shear walls. So if you guys remember when we were talking about our steel elements, we need something to stop our wall from tipping over. So we can put a brace in it. Well, that's hard sometimes in wood construction. Instead, what we do is we put something in here. Now, this is a little bit deeper than it should be, but you, you can see as long as I can get it tight in here, it stops it from going over. Now, we wouldn't want it to go that far. I just have a gap in there. If I had something that fit in here perfectly, it would be a shear wall. It wouldn't be able to move over. Plywood makes a great shear wall, as long as we design it properly. So we actually used to not do it very well, um, and then in big windstorms and some earthquakes, we were seeing damage. And when I say we, I'm talking about the construction industry in North America and the world. Um, so what happens? We have a load that happens right here, so it tries to shear, so it tries to slide, um, it tries to shear, and then it has uplift and compression. So imagine if you spread your feet while someone pushes you sideways. This side tries to lift up and this side tries to push down. So sliding, you can see this wasn't enough anchors. They need more anchors here at the bottom. Tries to shear along here. Well, you need specific nailing pattern and you, didn't, you wouldn't put your joint right here. You'd turn your panels the other way. If your story was too high for one panel, you'd stagger your joints. So you never had a spot with one continuous joint. And then how do you deal with the uplift? Well, um, we have specific thing called um, tie downs or uh, uh, tie down anchors or for, for these elements. At the roof here, we also care about um, uh, trusses lifting off. And so we have hurricane ties. So, Shear wall tie downs. These are some different ways you can do it. These are industry supplied products. You can even see a little image of some installed right here. Um, I find that uh, for residential construction, um, when I do a project, the number one thing that gets missed by the contractor is the tie downs. And trying to post install them is really, really difficult. Um, and so as much as it's on the structural drawings, I try to just remind everyone, hey, we've got tie downs in this project. You're going to need to install your tie downs, your hold downs. Wood shear wall. You can buy proprietary shear walls. So these would be designed by uh, a supplier, this particular supplier, Simpson Strong Tie. And so they would bring this to site and install it for the contractor. Now, as much as we have our walls not tipping over, we also have a floor that we don't want to rack. So we also consider part of our lateral load resisting system our diaphragm. So here we have uh, very specific rules on how we connect things. Um, there's specific nailing pattern that we need to meet to get that plywood to connect to our joists. Um, braced corners. So this would be a deck that we want open to underneath here. And you know intuitively that that doesn't do it. 
and you would probably naturally try to put these in and you've probably seen them. Um, what you're doing here is creating your own moment connection, which is why if you remember in plan, I said we tend to draw that moment connection as a solid dark circle in plan. Well, this is what we're doing. Uh, a lateral upgrade. Um, this is not a shear wall. Look at those seams that happen parallel to each other. All those want to slip past each other. Uh, and so this looks like somebody came in and put a brace in afterwards. Uh, bracing in wood, it can be done. It needs steel in conjunction with it, and these would be very specific, highly designed elements. So I always like to tell this story. Uh, this is um, Drew Mandel's house. He's an architect in Toronto, uh, fantastic guy and also a great designer. Um, remember I talked about the ubiquitous Toronto house? Well, this one was a new one that he built. It was, a, late, it was a, a very, very, very small parcel of land. You can see how tiny that parcel of land is. And so to get the living space, you can imagine, it is a very long, narrow building. This is a new construction, so that's in plan. The plan looks almost exactly like the elevation. Um, but you're going to need a stairwell to access these floors. So you've got ground floor, uh, second floor, third floor, roof. So you're going to need a stairwell. That takes out a chunk of uh, your building. Um, and maybe you have a wall here. So in plan, you're not left with a lot of spot for... Um, shear walls in this direction. So remember, this is a plan drawing. So you're not left with a lot of shear walls here. But you can see that the front of this is all um, window because you want light into this. You've got building here and building here. You don't have a lot of opportunity for light to get in. So those being open at each end is very important to get light into the building. So um, Drew was like, well, what will it take to make this happen? Um, um, and it was actually Dave that did it. I, I kind of came on board towards the end of this. I did some of the site reviews. Um, what they came up with was they were like, okay, well, we can do moment frames. But moment frames in wood are weird. Um, it's not normally done, and the connections are expensive. She was like, okay, all right, I got it. And we are like, well, normally wood is at um, 16 inches on center. These need to be at 8 inches on center. So you have to double up how often they occur. It's like, all right, okay, I get it. And we're like, mm. moment frames are uh, not as stiff. They're more expensive, and they're a little bit deeper. And he's like, all right, okay, I get it. So every, except for where the the uh, stairwell is, there, there was just a modified version of it. You can imagine every eight inches, there's a moment frame. And in elevation, that's the ground, uh, second, third roof. There it is in elevation. Every single one of these connectors, I think it needed something like 12 of these special screws that were like $5 each, which no big deal. You can see the cost that, that, you know, maybe that's expensive, but worth it. We had six of these connections with 12 of these screws at every frame that happened every eight inches. So not only were they expensive, but the labor to install them, you needed a special drill, they had to be perfectly straight. I think they needed to be pre-drilled um, ahead of actually installing them. They have some better stuff now um, for this. It was just the time frame that this was built. And what I love is when Hurricane Sandy hit in 2012, and Drew's bedroom is on the top floor, and Toronto saw some high winds, um, and Drew said he could feel he could feel the building moving and he just, he said that he kept laying there saying, stiffness is not related to strength. Stiffness is not related to strength. Stiffness is not related to strength. So he knew 
life safety was there. It was a safe building to be in, but it was maybe exceeding some of the normal deflection criteria you might normally expect. Okay, in wood, connections are all. You start to see some really chunky, ugly connections. These are uh, off the shelf. This is why understanding what the impact of the connection will be is very important. In wood, the connections tend to be where all the work is, um, uh, and you have to understand what that means to the overall look of your project. Here are some base connectors. We like to try to not have concrete touch the, the, the wood as much as possible because concrete um, uh, can attract moisture and we don't want that to wick up into our wood because it can rot the base. Um, if you go into old basements of old buildings, um, the wood posts tend to be rotted away at the bottom. And I've seen ones where you can just wiggle it and they're not actually sitting on the ground anymore. Um, and so we often do a little off stand just so any moisture can kind of flow in between there. Steel to wood, I say not recommended. You can totally do it, just not the place I'd start. I usually try to chase my steel and all the way down. Usually if we're using steel, it's because we're supporting something, typically masonry, um, within the wood building. And so then I try to chase my steel all the way down. And you can do very unique wood structures. So look at this one. It's, it's all, so this is the reciprocal frame longhouse that Dave and I did with Levitt Goodman. You can do arches in wood. Um, so you can see these are uh, um, uh, basically trusses um, in, in both directions sitting over arches. And maybe this one's a bit over-designed. I don't know what the criteria is for this one, um, but you can see you can do really unique things. You've seen this image before, one of my projects. Um, so this is uh, 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 tongue and groove decking on top of wood beams and girders and purlins on steel construction. Uh, NLT. NLT is a series of uh, wood elements just kind of all nailed together um, and it creates a deck. We can put rebar on top for crack control with a topping. It doesn't necessarily need this, but you probably want to ply wood for a smoother finish. Here's what NLT looks like from the underside. It used to be really popular in the 50s and 60s, um, and it's making a bit of a comeback. It's usually panelized and then hoisted into place. What's really cool is you can make small staggers in the underside um, of your element, giving you this curved arch look to it. CLT, um, this is the big one everyone likes to talk about. We'll talk about it a bit more next week too. But basically, you have two by elements on flat in this direction, and then you glue two by elements on flat in that direction, and you do that uh, three to seven times stacked, and this tape makes some nice panels. We're going to talk about some of the rules about these next week, but I just want to give you an intro and start getting the names into place. So this is CLT. You can see the top um, grain of these on flat, and you can see that they're connected across the joints here. Look at this, a little bit of water damage from it being exposed during construction. So I've, you've probably heard me say that wood construction and mass timber is the wild west right now. There's stuff that we just don't know how to do yet. We're learning it as we go and this is the industry as a whole. Um, and so some of it is water protection during construction. Not a thing that would normally be in the engineer's scope, um, but the contractor doesn't know to do it because it's not standard yet. Um, so there is communication required uh, between the trades that are until we kind of get standardized methods of doing things that we have to solve together. Uh, a built CLT project, so it can be quite beautiful. Um, people are finding that it's slightly less finished than they expected from some of these kind of promotional photos. So you have to be really aware of your exposure on your under specifying what that bottom bottom level is going to look like and what standards you need there. Um, should a name change the name of this? This is um, a thing my my husband invented. Um, uh, so it's um, there's a, a, a concrete version of this that's similar, 
um, but he adapted it to wood, um, uh, so it's being patented now. Um, if anything ever makes us rich, it might be that, possibly. Um, but basically, um, you use the concrete and the wood in composite. You put plastic balls from recycled material in it to limit the amount of concrete topping. So this helps with um, vibration and massing and your tread surface, uh, but the wood and the concrete work together quite nicely. So just some projects that are um, kind of in the works. This one uh, was a bit pie in the sky for a long time and I designed um, a foundation system for it in 2012 and now they're actually um, designing the wood structure for it. Um, so this is in the contract document phase right now. Uh, the four versions of uh, George Brown the Arbor that were presented. Um, this was the winning proposal by Mariana Tashima, I believe. This was the version that um, Dave and I worked on with Pat Cow and MJMA. Um, but all really lovely, amazing projects that were brought quite far in the competition phase. CAMH, uh, North Bay Condo, and most of those, if they're built, would be the tallest kind of wood structures uh, around in North America. I mean, not the not the Arbor one, but um, uh, the, the, the Gold Ring Tower for sure. Uh, so that wraps up our wood section. So I'll jump into the concrete one now. Okay, so now we're gonna start the concrete video. And so we're gonna go through and we're gonna look at some concrete images. Again, some of this is to show you what's happening internally in the concrete, and some of it is to show you what overall concrete construction looks like. I'm gonna try to breeze through these. These are mostly to have as a reference, um, but I just want you to hear some of the terminology going with it. All right, so a concrete column um, has reinforcing in it. So You'll hear us say concrete, but we're talking about reinforced concrete almost always. And these are pretty typical concrete columns or what they might look like. Um, so the blue is the outline of the concrete and the pink is the reinforcing inside it. There's bars that run the length of the column and then there's elements that wrap around it called ties. Those ties do two things. They help control cracking um, and they stop that long rebar from buckling outwards. So as that rebar wants to buckle, uh, the ties hold it tight in place. So here it is in round columns. And here you can start, one of the great things about concrete is you can do crazy shapes. It takes more form work um, to do some of these unique ones, but you can do unique things in concrete. A regular concrete beam. Uh, our depth, our width B, our tie, our bottom reinforcing, and top reinforcing. Um, these ties tend to be for shear reinforcing. These tend to be for bending. So concrete doesn't like tension at all. Uh, and so when we are bending this, the top cords in compression, and the bottom's in tension, so we tend to put steel in the bottom of that beam as our tension element. So here it is in cross-section and profile. You can see there's a cross-section of it. If we know that that beam is going to have reverse bending, we need to put the ties all the way around it as well. So if that beam sometimes can have reverse bending, we need to make sure we have ties that wrap all the way around. I find it easier just to specify. They won't actually do that and wrap it all the way around. What they do is they take two shoes and slip them down past each other like that. A flat plate. So this is um, a, a concrete slab that has no visible beams. What you can't tell is that there's extra reinforcing in the depth of the slab from column to column that is acting like a beam. Um, so we have beams kind of hidden within the concrete slab for this. Now slabs tend to perform poorly for shear. Remember, it's like holding up a, a marshmallow or jello on, pop, on toothpicks. It wants to slip down past it. 
So what we'll often do is um, thicken it right at the column, the top of the column. So we can add drop panels. Or we can go even further and add drop panels with capitals. Here are beams with a slab spanning from beam to beam, resting on the column. Waffle slab. Um, they used to do this a lot in the 50s and 60s when labor was cheap and material was expensive. It was worth forming all of these little, little bits here. They would usually be like a block of some sort that they would put into the formwork. Um, and now uh, it's cheaper to just fill it all in with concrete and deal with it that way. Again, that's changing. You can cast in purlins and beams. Again, it's a lot of formwork and it doesn't save you that much. It adds a lot in labor. It doesn't take away that much material. Um, so this is a slab that spans from this beam to this wall. So that uh, is a one-way slab and you've got a beam here. Two-way slab, it was really hard. To, it, the concrete buildings are so big in scale that it's hard to get a picture that kind of captures it. So we've got beams all the way around and a little bit of this slab load goes to each one of these beams. Um, and we're gonna talk about this next week. If this is our slab, quarter of it gets supported by each beam. If this is our slab, these end beams are similar, but look at this. These ones in this middle zone are acting like they're carrying half of the slab on each side of it. And so this, as, as these proportions between the sides of the slab get bigger, it starts to become a one-way slab and not a two-way slab. You can do cool things with concrete. You can make it a shell. Remember, you have to deal with that thrust problem. And they dealt with it by making it a circle, and so it's always pushing against another one that's pushing out. Holocore. Remember I said that uh, it's not great to run your mechanical through it? Well, here's why. So this is where it is at a joint over a steel beam. Look at how they bust that out there. They're going to drop rebar. So basically they've busted out these flutes here. They're going to drop rebar in. And then from here to here, they're going to fill it with concrete or grout. Um, so it starts to get really hard. Like, so look, this is one panel. They've busted this one and this one and this one to kind of keep, um, to make it act like these are tied together over this joint. Precast, you can get your concrete precast um, and here's a T beam. Uh, you can do a double T. We don't do a lot of it in um, Ontario and there's not a ton of it in North America. You see it a lot in the like highway bridge industry which isn't what we're focused on here. That's not to say some of you might not do that in your career, but it's not really the focus of what we're talking about here in this program. So here you can see these are made off site. They have to be brought on a truck, so they have to fit on a truck. You're limited in length, you're limited in width, width um, and then it gets hoisted and installed into place. Bubble deck, so this is what Bubble Lamb um, was built on. So they take precast panels, uh, um, install them in place, put rebar and uh, voided plastic bubbles um, in it, and then they pour the concrete over it. So you have an increase in depth, but you take out a lot of the concrete weight. Um, so there's two benefits to that. You take out a lot of concrete weight, which means it's a, which means it's a lighter load on it but you also take out a lot of the environmental impact by removing a large amount of concrete mass. Um, these are great on regular systems, less great on irregular systems. So uh, one Spadina, the addition, was done with bubble deck. I don't know that it was maybe the best choice 
for that. Um, but it was cool and new at the time, um, and I totally get why that decision was made. Um, uh, it's um, come a long way since then. Um, um, but in, in one Spadina, in unique spots, they have a lot more solid panels than they anticipated. And when, when they first started constructing these, you can see that these are all black. On a hot day, they were getting really spongy. You can see these are, some of these are dented on the top. If you dent them and collapse them, um, you're filling that with concrete mass that you didn't count on. Um, so it can have an impact on the design. Precast. You can do all kinds of crazy cool precast things. As long as you can ship it there and hoist it into place, you can do it in precast. Tilt up. Not common here in Southern Ontario. I'm from Nova Scotia and there was actually a very large tilt up concrete market there. So what they do is they cast the slab, they put down slip sheets and then they use the slab as the form for the walls. So now, instead of having to do wood formwork, they've already got a concrete slab. They lay some plastic down, they put some perimeter sides on, and they cast the concrete with hooks into it so that then they can hoist it into place. And you can see these were already even attached to it. And as they lift this into place, somebody stands there and lets those drag out, almost like those, um, those cheap folding chairs. Um, uh, that you like kind of store in the back room for when you have a party or something like that. You can get all kinds of precast elements. They're really good for stairs, um, stadiums. Paneling for siding is a great use of precast. Um, precast columns and beams, again, not that common here. Concrete walls, you're gonna see this again in the, in the lateral load resisting system lecture. You can see how maybe alterations become hard. You don't know what scope of this was uh, part of your lateral load or dependent as a lateral load resisting system. So coming and putting a door in here, you're demolishing structure, not just finishes. A concrete core, so this would be the elevator in a tall building. Um, uh, so this would go up several stories and then the rest of the building would be kind of connected to it for its lateral system. Concrete portal frames, basically moment frames. All right, footings. So this is a concrete footing. You can see there's reinforcing in both directions underneath there at the bottom, but lifted up from the dirt so concrete fits underneath it. And then there's going to be a column um, but we need to connect the footing to the column. So what we do is we have dowels. So these are rebar that sticks up, and then when it's time to do the columns, they'll come back and tie the rebar cage for the column to these dowels. All right, remember I said that um, inspecting uh, rebar becomes difficult? See this fine grid? These are probably 15s at uh, 250 on center is my guess, just a ballpark look. And you can see they're lifted up off the bottom. We need concrete to get underneath there. These are the chairs that hold it up, and that's a specific height because that distance is our fire protection. So we need the concrete to actually protect our steel. Remember I said that concrete's great in compression and bad in tension, and so we put steel at the bottom. So why wouldn't we just put the steel right at the very bottom? Well, we want to have that benefit of concrete and fire protection, so we actually use the underside of the concrete as the fire protection for the steel. And it's what holds the steel in place. The concrete actually holds it up. All right, here's where I said the inspection gets really difficult. We have four layers of steel here, and we have piping going through it, it's hard to fit your feet through. I could maybe fit my feet in these, but when they're 12 inches on center and you've got work boots on, it's hard to fit your feet in between there. So they have to be able to hold somebody's weight. You're walking around. It's a real hazard where there's columns, there's rebar sticking up. Um, so we've got a bottom lower layer, a bottom upper layer, a top lower layer, and a top upper layer. Um, and those would all be specified in what direction they're going. And so you would have to go around and you have to check 
the spacing of these as a representative sample in all four layers. Rebar in a beam. So here's a nice extruded view I found online. Our ties are the little black ones and the red ones are our structural steel. Here's where a column meets a slab in slightly, a slightly longer condition, a larger condition. You can see we've got ties for the rebar. Look at the size of that rebar. It starts to be hard to bend it there. Remember I said a big part of concrete is the formwork? Well, concrete formwork is a big part of the engineering, um, not designed by the base building engineer, that's done by a shoring engineer. Um, but you have to be able to see the re re rebar to inspect it. So they usually put one side of the formwork up, install their reinforcing, let the inspector review it, and then they put the inside formwork on. It has to be braced and held in place while they pour the concrete, and then they have to wait seven days until they can strip the formwork. So you can see the walls this is one floor, and then there's gonna be a second floor, but we need to be able to connect those together. So you have to dowel wall level to wall level together. Here's a foundation just starting to have the forms stripped away. You can see there were cast in elements, probably to support beams locally, or maybe those are to accept the tie down anchors. <clears throat> the formwork for a slab, um, you can see that it gets very, very complicated and busy at the underside of this slab. And so here's what the formwork would look like. This would be the underside of your slab. This would be your beam. You need to stop the concrete from flowing out the sides. Um, you need to support that plywood. So this would all be done by somebody specifically trained to do this. This wouldn't be the base building engineer scope. There are people who specifically do this. What the base building engineer is doing is providing documents for the final state of the building. And this would be under the contractor's scope. The thing to keep in mind is, is there somewhere that they could damage the finishes we care about in the final state? Um, so here they are flying the forms. Like I said, what makes it cost effective is being able to reuse your formwork several times. So you, um, you uh, cast a floor, put your formwork in, you wait seven days, maybe only two days and you keep your shoring in. It depends. There are staggered rules on what they can do. Um, and you start to go up. And then once this floor is cured, you can start to take that form out with a crane and fly it up to the next floor. So usually there's several floors and several stages of curing. Um, so you'll, like if these are four floors of formwork you need and what makes it cost effective is reusing it three to four times, you can see that you want a 12 story building with repetitive floor plates to make it cost effective to do it in concrete. Um, when I started in the industry, periforms didn't exist. They're basically um, a supplier of formwork. Just heard a child cough. Um, that are very specifically engineered for what they do. Instead of just using two buys, they have kind of proprietary trust systems that they've created that they reuse. Um, so they have become, they've basically taken over the concrete formwork market. And so you can see periforms here. A fiberglass form for a round column. Um, one of the things about concrete is it imprints the texture of the surface that it's cast against. Cast it against a flat steel, steel surface, you're gonna get a beautiful finish. But who can afford to do a steel formwork? If you're doing that, why wouldn't you just build a steel building? Wood has grain, um, it has texture, it has different oils in it as well. All of that can bleed into the, con the look of the concrete. Um, most people try to hide it, but sometimes you can do very specific, beautiful things with it. I'm sure you've all heard of board form concrete. So here is some board form concrete. This was done specifically. Um, the boards were picked, so instead of just using plywood, 
they used um, pieces of wood and the concrete was cast against that as the formwork. Uh, insulated concrete formwork tends to be something everybody wants to do um, without maybe necessarily understanding the pros and cons of it. It has some great unique qualities in that it's your formwork and it provides insulation on two sides of your building. As our requirements for uh, kind of environmental requirements in buildings go up, this is very handy. Um, the very first project I did with it, um, the owner insisted that this is what they wanted, um, but it was a, a strip mall kind of store. Um, it was a high-end one, um, but it was almost all windows at the front. And unless you're kind of under 25% window, all of your heat loss is happening through your window. It doesn't matter how good they are. And this was pretty much redundant and didn't really do much. Um, that said, it can be great. One of the problems structurally with it is that it's pretty busy inside. And we already have kind of a filigree of reinforcing inside our formwork. And we have very strict requirements on how they have to get that concrete from the top down to the bottom. So they have to have it flow a certain amount of flowability. There's air entrainment that we put in it. They have to vibrate it. They have to make sure every little bit of that wall has concrete in it. Um, if you've ever tried to fill uh, a, a small cake pan with um, cake batter, you know you can get like bumps and holes if your cake batter is too thick. So that's kind of the problem we have here. Um, when it's ICF, or insulated concrete formwork, this is what they look like inside to hold our reinforcing. They want to build in all the ways you could assemble your rebar. <coughs> but it adds a bunch of stuff in the inside of our formwork. So now getting our concrete in is even harder. Um, I've seen projects where what we've done is we've taken a pencil and just pushed it through the formwork. Just, you can stuff it with like some caulking to get the insulation back. And the pencil's gone all the way through. Um, so there was no concrete actually inside the bottom of that formwork. They had to hire a scanner to scan it and see how much concrete was actually there. Placing concrete, that's a whole other thing. Actually getting the concrete into place in these hard to reach spots with basically cake batter um, so it's a liquid but it's a really thick 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 liquid so you can see this isn't so bad but what happens when this is all wet concrete and you're trying to cast your concrete over here the physics of these things I find absolutely wild um, what they can do is crane it in and dump it um, so you get one big chunk of concrete at once but you can imagine you have to keep that going pretty quickly. Um, you can't let that stop or else you're going to see seams in your concrete that you don't want. And then you have to finish the concrete. You have to trowel it. Um, and then if you want a broom finish, for example, there's different finishes you can put on your concrete. <clears throat> okay, I didn't know where to lump in uh, masonry and block, so I've just put it in here. Um, this is load bearing block wall where we've got reinforcing in it. Um, so we have all the same rules that we need to get for getting the concrete down into this. Usually though, we can use really flowable concrete, almost a grout, if you will. In these layers in between, we have something called ladder ties, which ties them together and they work for seismic loads. Um, and we need our reinforcing um, for shear and uh, gravity loads. So you can see uh, this is a non-load bearing block wall. Um, so this is just an interior partition, but we need to brace the top of it. But simultaneously, we don't want it to take load. You could say, okay, great. I uh, will build it right up to the underside of the open web steel joist. But if we do that, when the joist goes to bend, it will load this block wall and it's not what it was designed for. So we need to brace it without putting load on it. Uh, you can do really cool things with block. This is NCFS uh, headquarters uh, um, in downtown Toronto. And so this, these were actually precast specialty masonry blocks. So they could fit um, rebar in the back, but they had a planter built into it. Again, very cool and patterning this. I uh, had very specific layouts with the reinforcing for this. In fact, originally 
they were supposed to have locations where some of the block was turned so you could see the patterning uh, of the block. All right, so what do you do at a non-load bearing block wall to brace it laterally but make sure it doesn't take gravity loads? <clears throat> well, you do something to stop it from tipping over, but when this deck goes up and down, you need um, a compressible material so the deck can go up and down without applying load to the top of the block. Uh, masonry, you can do columns in masonry. Um, uh, that's not a problem. They're usually big and chunky. Um, it's usually a very specific look. Beams, eh, eh, no way. That's not what we're doing with uh, masonry. And then what other things can we do with concrete? We can get really cool. They're coming out with things like translucent concrete. Um, I recently did a, a talk on kind of new, new projects. Like what are the frontiers of concrete? Um, and uh, there was all kinds of really cool stuff. I'll... I'll um, should add that into the end of this. So I'll add those into the ends of this slide. Uh, so I won't talk about them, but you'll see them uh, in the in the slides. Conk innovation. Okay, that's the end of the concrete lecture. I'm gonna see if uh, school's canceled. Okay, uh, school still seems to be running. Uh, I had to do registration for swimming lessons because it's all a bit of a, a, a panic um, and it like it it opens at 6 45 in the morning and it's a mad rush luckily I checked minutes before uh, the time was so we got our our uh, our, uh, our spot that we need because we have <clears throat> our kids are so close in age that they can be in the exact same swimming lesson which is huge because there was a shutdown for so long um, Imagine we only have to do one time slot instead of having them on different nights at different times. They can, right now they're doing all of their activities together. So they're in the same skating lessons and they're in the same swimming lessons and they all start back up kind of now. <clears throat> so we're good, we got what we needed. Okay, lateral load resisting systems. Now, these pictures, you've already seen most of them. Um, these were in the other slideshows um, when we talked about steel and wood and concrete. Um, but I'm gonna show them to you again, just so that you have them. If you're confused about lateral load resisting systems and what they look like, you have them all amalgamated into one spot without having to go to each slideshow. So again, a lot of these are for you kind of going forward in your career. And when you hear me talk about them, if you're feeling confused, you have a quick reference to go back and look at them all. Um, so, uh, and remember, when do you need a lateral load resisting system? Every floor, every direction, every building. I remember one time I had a student in studio was doing a series, their, their big studio project was a series of small one-story buildings kind of scattered over a whole kind of development. Um, uh, unfortunately, they were glass boxes, a, a bunch of them. And when I asked what their lateral load resisting system was, they said, oh, I don't, I don't need one. I was like, what do, you, what do you mean you don't need one? They're like, oh, my buildings are only one story. I don't need a lateral load resisting system. But yes, every floor, even if it's only one story, every direction, but if you have one in this direction and one in this direction, that can usually do the work in that direction. Usually, I know you've all heard the crazy story about the building in New York. Um, it had a lateral load resisting system on the diagonal. It just was slightly less than what they expected it to be. Um, and every building needs it. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's a shed, if it's a, if it's a boathouse, you need a lateral load resisting system everywhere. How was your run? Good. Yeah. Um, so every floor, every direction, every building. This is going to be a question I ask you again and again and again, and I will always give you the answer because this, if, if there's one thing you take away from my course, when you start drawing drawings, I want you to remember that you need a lateral load resisting system. Every floor, every building, every direction. Uh, school's not canceled. Dave, it looks like schools are open. Dave, he's deaf, he can't hear me. He walked away. Dave, schools are not canceled. Oh, okay. Just to give you the heads up. You were on the edge of your seat too, weren't you? Yeah. Um, uh, Okay, so let's start looking at our lateral load resisting systems. 
a diagonal tension compression brace. We've already looked at this in our steel system. So you can tell this one's probably taking compression as well because it's a bit chunky. Um, we can see that we can get some crazy detailing requirements where our columns and our braces meet. Throw in a beam and it gets even more complicated. So you've got a column, you've got beams from uh, four directions, and you've got braces in two directions all coming into one spot on a column. So how you make all these meet and how you do all of that becomes very tricky. This is done by the fabricator's engineer but it needs to be reviewed by us. And if there's something really specific architecturally that is required here, then we need to make that clear in our documents. So it's important that you're aware that there's a lot going on here so that you can take the time to check and see if you have any special requirements. Um, tension only bracing. I can tell that this is tension only bracing simply because it looks very tiny. Um, and if it looks very tiny for how long it is, this is where I say everything you need to know about structures you already know, you and your gut know that if that was a column, it would look too small. Um, and so that means you know that in compression, you would expect it to buckle. Intuitively, you know that, you feel that. Um, and that's how you know that that would be a tension only element. Our eccentric brace. Uh, angles, channels, rods. Again, we already looked at all of these. These are all just clumped together. This should be like only a few minute slideshow. Uh, our big water tower, you can see these are very slender. Um, uh, so when I say it needs to be in every direction, they probably could have done this water tower with um, only four sides done on it, but they made them very small by doing them all the way around unique bracing, uh, chevron bracing. Uh, just going back to unique bracing, just so I don't feel like I'm completely breezing through this. Um, gold ring had a really neat thing where we had um, low roof and high roof and we had doorways. So am I gonna be able to draw it? Um, so we had one bay of our truss that had a high roof on one side and a low roof on the other. And it was only about a meter difference in height. But we need framing for both of those to pick up our roofing. Um, so we had a unique thing happening and we also had doorways that we needed at each end. Uh, so I'm trying to trying to remember exactly how it all went together. Um, oh, and then there was another weird one where we had a doorway in it. Uh, let's put it over here. So I'm just gonna draw one side of it or else I'm gonna kill a bunch of time here. So we had weird bracing because we had two stories with, or we had one story with a low roof and a high, a high roof and a low roof. We had this weird bracing where there was a doorway where we had to make this crazy brace because we couldn't run it straight. And then in this bay here, we couldn't get a diagonal strong enough to work. So that column isn't actually crooked. What we actually did is that is a solid steel plate with a door opening cut out of it and that was a hallway that ran all the way through all the trusses so the last bays of our trusses on gold ring were solid steel plate walls i remember walking through it with patricia pat cow uh, kind of when the steel was installed and she was so angry that it had to be fire protected because it was so beautiful you know it was this inch and a half thick steel wall um, and it was really lovely. It was so nice, uh, but it did need to be protected for fire. So it's kind of hidden behind drywall. Um, our K and chevron bracing, double chevron bracing. Again, I know we've looked at all of these. Uh, uh, you can start to see that maybe they had something going on here, or maybe they're put just in the process of putting the next floor in. Our super bracing. 
heavy bracing where maybe this should have just been a plate steel wall like my project. <clears throat> Wood bracing, an eccentric joist, and our round building. So literally I just took the lateral system from each of the material topics and put them in here. So I'm gonna stop even talking about some of these and I'm gonna flip flirt through in case something triggers in my mind. So our cool combo system, uh, steel framed pin arch, moment frames. Sometimes you'll hear them called portal frames. Uh, our wood shear walls, again, I talked about these um, and how important these hold downs are and how they often tend to get missed. Oh, are you about to do the garbage? Are you doing the garbage? Awesome, thank you. The garbage day too. Uh, wood shear wall, small wood shear wall. Plywood diaphragm, braced corners, uh, lateral upgrade, our wood bracing again. And I talked about Drew's house. Okay, concrete shear walls, a concrete core. This one's a bit crazy. This would be very unique, but a concrete portal frame. Um, if actually I did a project, um, it was a renovation of a building at York University. Um, uh, and um, I had the old existing drawings and didn't talk about the lateral load resisting system and I couldn't find it on the drawings and when I looked at the gravity load system um, it seemed really over designed the columns were over designed and so um, uh, the person I was working closely with at the time we were just we were stumped we were baffled and then we decided what happens if we so I basically created a modern day model of that building so what happens if we run it as moment frames in both directions and lo and behold, every column and every slab and every beam was designed exactly as it should be. So sometimes understanding the backstory is huge, which is also why in our drawings today, we try to put information on the drawings that make it clear, not just how to build it, but what the intent of the system is so that somebody coming in 30 years and trying to do a renovation can understand what the intended load path was. And in fact, for lateral load resisting systems um, in certain seismic zones now, what they do, especially for steel, so you can imagine you come along, you take the drywall down, and you're like, oh, this is, this, isn't, this is just a little thin rod. This isn't doing much. I'm going to cut a hole in it. But it, it's a high seismic zone, and that was part of the lateral load resisting system. So what they actually do now in those zones is they have special spray paint, and it's a specific color and it is um, and it's spray painted so when somebody comes and opens the drywall they know every contractor in California and Vancouver and northern Quebec know that if they see that spray paint it means that it's part of the lateral load resisting system and they need to back away and not touch it all right that was the end of uh, that slideshow let's jump in to the final one here all right, foundations. So this one does have um, some math in it. Okay, so foundations. Um, I'm gonna tell you right now, the strip and spread footings make awesome exam questions. There will 100% be a math question for that. Um, pay attention to whether I'm looking for a dimension or the overall area. That tends to be what screws people up. And because it can't be that easy, I do make it a multiple choice often, but I might put the dimension as an option or an area. I, uh, I have to, I can't just give you the answer. I have to make you work for it a tiny little bit. Try to make it as easy as possible, but I also have to prove to everyone that I made you Made you do a little bit of work. Okay, so those will definitely be questions. And I have a few other things that in this that I'm gonna tell you make great exam questions as well. Okay, so what's the role of the foundation? Well, it needs to transfer the building loads to the ground. It needs to be able to stop the building from sliding. And it needs to be able to resist the over turning of the building. The, the, the foundation can't fail. 
Uh, it needs to not experience unreasonable amounts of settlement. So that's total versus differential. And we don't want it to heave. So water, when it freezes, expands. And when things expand, they push the things away around it. If any of you have ever left a beer can in the freezer overnight and woke up to a messy, disgusting freezer, you know that wa water will expand um, and can bust that can open. Well, what we don't want is the water to freeze and do that to our foundations and lift our whole building up. Frost goes down into the ground at different rates in different locations. In Toronto, in the winter, we can see frost going down four feet. So all of our foundations in Toronto go down four feet. Once you're going down four feet, you might as well go down eight feet or 10 feet and have a foundation. Once you're there digging, it's not that much more work to add in the basement. In places like Florida, you would rarely see a foundation or a, a basement simply because they don't need to go down for frost. So why would they go to all that work to put in a basement they don't need? So in Toronto or in Southern Ontario, we go down four feet for frost. If you convert that, it's 1.22 meters or 1.2 meters, somewhere in that range. <coughs> Again, great exam question, frost, soil. Okay. So what's settlement? Well, if you've got a bunch of um, grains in a certain way and we put load on it, they'll shift. If you've ever taken uh, uh, like coffee or flour and shaken your container and you thought it was full, 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 and then they all resettle and all of a sudden um, you've got more room at the top. Well, we don't want that to happen or else a whole building is going to go bloop. Settlement due to depletion of moisture. If you've got materials or uh, stuff that has moisture in amongst it, if it dries out, that moisture goes away and your soil compresses or it shrinks almost. Um, if you've ever seen picture, if you've ever walked outside on a hot, dry day, the day after a rainstorm, you've probably seen that where the, the mud dries up and kind of ends up cracking because it's shrunk a little bit. And then settlement due to migration of fine particles. So we've got big elements and small elements all mixed together and water comes and washes away all the fines. Well, the bigs then clump together. Being in Toronto in the winter, um, you guys have probably all um, experienced um, or heard of um, a water main break being a problem. And sometimes the way they find them is a sinkhole. So it freezes. The pipe, which was probably not down four feet for frost, busts. It then warms up and nobody knows that this pipe is busted and water starts to flow out of this pipe and it washes away all of the fine particles in a spot that wasn't used to that. Um, all the fine particles leave and eventually um, the big particles kind of start to cave in on each other and then a road collapses or something like that. So that's really kind of how sinkholes start to happen. So what's differential settlement? <clears throat> differential settlement is when one side of your building drops more than the other. We always have movement. There is always some amount of settlement in soil. We accept um, uh, uh, an inch of overall settlement and three quarters of an inch of differential settlement. Um, this information is given to us by a geotechnical engineer, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what we want to do is make sure one side doesn't drop more than the other. The whole building dropping together isn't great, but it's not quite as bad as one side dropping without the other, where everything will crack and get destroyed. So how can soil fail? Like, what, where does it go? It just, like, disappears? Well, kind of. As you squash down on if anyone's kneaded bread dough, you know if you take your fist and push down in the middle, that bread dough pushes out around the side. Now, I know we're talking about doing it in a massive amount of bread dough, but what it can do is bulge if it's contained. If you put it in the bowl and you knead it, it will bulge at the top. And that's really what's happening. So if you see the soil bulging, we've got a sheer failure along a plane. So really what's happening is it's slipping. Now, normally for the bread, it's slipping along the dough to metal bowl slip surface and it's slipping out the side and bulging out the top. So how do we find out what we need to know about our soil? 
Well, it is actually very heavily mandated that the geotechnical engineer, which is a separate scope from the structural engineer, cannot be carried by the structural engineer or the architect in Ontario. Um, your professional liability insurance, my professional liability insurance, and our governing bodies dictate that. Um, they are hired directly by the owner to give us a bunch of information. So how does the owner who knows nothing about construction, I mean, maybe not if you're a developer like Allied or something like that, or Mattamy Homes, uh, but if you're a regular homeowner, how do you hire this geotechnical engineer and you have to tell them what you need for the architect, but the architect is, should be the one talking to them? Well, what usually happens is the architect and the engineer write a term of reference where we say, hey, owner, these are the things you should ask them, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and so we basically tell them what they need, and then they hire the geotechnical engineer. And then the geotechnical engineer goes to the site. They might dig a test pit, um, so down some amount. Um, they'll do boreholes, and maybe they'll do auger or percussion boring. Um, they'll take soil samples, and they'll say, oh, okay, you have this type of soil, but engineer, here are the really important things. You need to go down this far to hit this type of soil and you can bear this amount of load on it. And once we know that, we have something we can work with. We know possibly what we need to do now. So they'll give us that bearing capacity for strength, but they'll also give us a bearing capacity to make sure we don't get differential settlement. So they give us two different bearing capacities They'll also give us earthquake criteria because eventually there's two parts to it. It's the soil that puts the load into our building. So remember, it's literally an earthquake. The earth is shaking. And so how that seismic load transfers for this through the soil has an impact on how our building behaves. And so they tell us what type of soil is going to cause our earthquake loads on our building. And then we take those loads on our building and then bring them back out into the soil. So it's kind of this funny loop. We want the building, we want the seismic loads to basically kind of do this to the ground, make our building shake, but then have our building kind of put those loads back into the soil. They'll tell us how deep we have to go to get that bearing and they'll always put a reminder about frost. Um, in Edmonton, the frost depth is was it 10 feet or eight feet? Eight, I think it was eight feet. Um, so every location is slightly different. Southern Ontario, all of Southern Ontario is four feet though. Um, there, they have a slightly different style of foundation construction because of that. They tend not to have great soil, um, so they don't want to go down and do normal foundations the way we would do here. So they do a slightly different style of foundation construction. And I'll talk about that when I get to that slide. And then, because of all of that, they'll be like, hey, listen, I'm not designing the building, but in this type of soil, we tend to see this type of foundation. And so often, even in the terms of reference, we'll give them an idea of what the building is gonna look like. Because what they might do for a steel build, or might suggest for a steel building might be different for a concrete building. Um, so they do take the building we're building into consideration, even though the building's not designed yet. So we have to give them some little bit of information to help them out. So what are some typical bearing capacities? Now, this is just a guideline until you get something from a geotechnical engineer. If you don't have a geotechnical report when the design starts, you have to make an assumption. So sometimes I will go for permit on a project um, with an assumption of a soil type, but there is a clause that that has to be confirmed prior to it being built. Um, that somebody, event, and that can't be me, I cannot determine the bearing capacity of the soil, that has to be the geotechnical engineer. <clears throat> to achieve our bearing capacity, we have to have undisturbed soil, there can be no organic material, and excavations have to be cleaned by hand. What does that mean? Well, that just means you can't have large chunks of stuff. You can imagine if you're digging with a backhoe 
You can have big chunks of stuff left behind. We need it to be relatively flat with no chunks of stuff. So if it's if you can pick it up by hand, it needs to be gone. Um, um, something if you need if it's pick up by your fingertips, that can probably stay. That's really what they're trying to say. They're trying to give you a gauge on what level of clean you have to have uh, on the ground there. Um, so the, the most common footing type is a spread footing. They come in two forms, a strip footing, which would go under a wall, and a pad footing, which would go under a column. The principles are the same. You see this area underneath here? Well, that is transferring the load out into the ground. So we have a load on this, and we need to get it through something out into the ground. And that ground can resist a certain amount of load per a certain amount of area. All right, bearing capacity must be greater than the bearing pressure. So we want to make sure our bearing resistance or capacity is greater than our factored bearing or our factored bearing load. Our, our, sorry, our factored bearing pressure. So we want factored load to be less than the reduced capacity. What the what the geotechnical engineer gives us is the reduced capacity. We know that the bearing area or the bearing pressure is force divided by area. So we have some force coming out over some area. That is our bearing load. Um, so PF is our factored load and area is our area of bearing. Now, some of this I've jumped the gun on what we're going to be talking about. In two weeks, we're really going to talk about loads and forces and areas. And then in structures two, we're going to talk about stress. Um, but I think conceptually you get the idea that if I stood um, here in Bluntstones, or if I went outside in the snow in high heels, I'm going to sink down into the snow. If I put Bluntstones on, my load's going to spread out a little bit better. The surface area of my foot in contact with the snow increased, so it was more likely to hold me in place. If I went outside in snowshoes, which have a gigantic area, and stood on the snow, I'd probably be able to stay on top of the snow. So think of me as the load, the shoes as our footing, and the soil as, and the snow as the soil. So that's really what we're trying to achieve here. The bigger it is, the more likely it's going to spread the load out in a way that we can keep the factored bearing pressure less than the capacity of the soil. So let's do an example here. <clears throat> This here, okay, a column with a total load of 1,000 kilonewtons sits on a spread footing bearing on till. Assume that a square footing of dimensions D by D will be used. What's the minimum dimension D that can be used? Okay, so let's just talk about what we've got here. Well, actually, the very first thing, just while I have this slide, these slides open, it said bearing on till. We need to know what capacity till has. We have our load, and we need to know what capacity we can have. Let's go back and take a look at that slide for a second. Where did it go? Oh, I went too far. All right, till. 200 kPa. So they're telling us our soil can resist 200 kPa. kPa is a kilonewton per meter squared. So every meter squared of till can resist one, uh, 200 kilonewtons. All right, so let's take a look at this. Make my screen bigger. All right, 
so we have we don't know what exactly it looks like but we know we've got some column of some sort coming down on some footing that sits on soil under here. They've told us that the BR of this soil is till, which we looked up is 200 kPa. They also told us that the load on this column is a thousand kilonewtons. We need to know what the dimensions of this footing are. They have told us it's square, so it's D by D. So we know that the area of our footing is D by D, but we don't know what D is. We know that we need our factored load to be less than our reduced capacity, or we need BF to be less than BR. Now, if this were exactly equal, we'd know the exact amount of footing we would need. Okay, so let's just imagine we made these equal here. All right, so BF equals BR. That would be the most perfectly designed footing in the history of the world. That would be exactly. So it's less than, but let's, oh, I hear a child just woke up. I hear little footsteps. I'm sorry, I'm like, uh, 15 20 minutes from done um, so we've we, we've got it almost we've got it we've got uh, it exactly designed perfectly um, so imagine that BF is like point zero 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 one less than BR so it's less than but it's so less than it's practically equal so that would be perfect. We would know we have the exact right footing then, okay? Well, we also know that what we're doing is taking this load and spreading it out over this area. Or we have BF equals PF divided by A. And if BF is equal to BR, BR is gonna equal PF divided by A. Well, we know A is D times D, so BR equals PF divided by D squared. When we know what BR is, and we know what PF is, we can find what D is. So D is going to equal square root of PF divided by BR. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Oh, do you want to say hi? Do you want to say hi to my students? Duncan, come here. Do you want to say hi to everyone? No? Do you want to stay in my lap while I finish doing this? No. Okay, I've got to just put my camera back down here for a second. It's just so. Okay, I've somehow moved it back further now. Okay, so we can now just plug this in. D is going to equal the square root of a thousand kilonewtons divided by 200. Let's plug this in to our calculator. If Malcolm was here, he'd just tell us the answer. square root of 1,000 divided by 200 equals 2.236 meters. So for this footing to support this load, this side needs to be 2.236 and this side needs to be 2.236. So technically that's the right answer. Now one of the things we're going to talk about 
next week is that that's not really how they build things. You wouldn't build it to that dimension. What we would typically put on most drawings and most requests for contractors is they tend to do it in two inch increments or 50 millimeter increments. So um, this being uh, a five or like so 0 0.05 or um, a point ones. So those would be the level of refinement. So I would probably, if I was asking you what footing worked here, I would say a 2.25 meter by 2.25 meter footing would be a really good footing to use. If it was smaller than this number, would it work? No, that would be like going out in the snow in high heels. If I made it bigger than this, like I made it a tiny bit bigger here, but only nominally to make it easier to build. If I made this five meters by five meters, would it work? Yeah, it's like going out in the snowshoes, but I'm standing on dirt, not snow. Um, so oh, that would be overkill. Remember, we wanna build the cheapest thing that works. Um, and this works. Five meters by five meters would be too big. Okay, let's take a look. There's one more math problem. Okay, so here's that all worked out. All right, let's do one of the walls. Let's do a strip footing on a wall this time. So we have a wall with a, with a total load of 20 kilonewtons per meter. So every meter length of wall is supporting 20 kilonewtons. We don't know how long the wall is, that's almost irrelevant because every meter of it's supporting 20 kilonewtons. And it sits on a strip footing with a width B bearing on loose sand. What minimum dimension is needed for B? Well, let's go back and look at um, uh, that, that list. So it was loose sand. So loose sand or gravel, 50 kPa. So we have what bearing capacity we have. Okay, <clears throat> so let's make this bigger. And we can do the math out for this one. All right, so what we're saying here in this one is we have a wall now. And we don't know how long it is, but it's some length. Let's just say we're talking about one meter length of wall. Let's talk about it in one meter length. Oh, sorry guys, this is, I didn't realize it was off the page. So this is one meter length of wall on a strip footing. So if we're saying we're talking about one meter length of wall, they told us every meter of wall has 20 kilonewtons acting on it. So one meter, 20 kilonewtons. This is sitting on soil that had a BR yeah. of 50 kPa. So BR is bearing capacity for this, Duncan. Okay. <clears throat> and we need to know, well, we know that this, is a, if this wall is a meter long. The strip footing underneath it is a meter long. And this is how wide our footing needs to be, or B, our dimension B. We're gonna say our BR is equal to our BF would give us the perfect footing. That would be exactly right. So that's our 50 kPa. We know that BF equals PF divided by A. For us, A is one meter times B. B is what we don't know here. So let's take a look. We've got uh, BF equals PF divided by one times B. We know what BF or BR is, depending how we wanna talk about it, and we know what PF is. We wanna know what B is. Let's rearrange this. B is going to equal, multiply this, bring it over here, 
PF divided by BF, or 20 divided by 50. The minimum dimension required for B is 20 divided by 50 is 0 0.4, and that's in meters. That's actually a pretty good number footing to build. Um, if we went smaller than this, if we made this narrower, does this footing work? No, it would be like going outside in the snow in high heels. If we made it bigger, would it work? Yes, but we don't need to because then it would be more expensive than we need it to be. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that's the end of our calculations here. You can see that that's been worked out here. Hold on a second, I just need to turn the camera back up here. Okay, let's sit like this now, okay? All right, so let's see what's next. How do we do an excavation? What we don't want is the soil to all slough into the hole. When we dig a hole, if you've ever gone to the beach with uh, a sibling and you've dug a beautiful, perfect hole in the sand uh, and uh, your sibling comes over and stands on the end and what was the perfect hole now all caves in. What? That looks like a big, big foot. It looks like a big, big foot? Yeah, a big foot. Ah, a well. big old foot. Well, this is like digging a hole in the sand and we're looking at what the hole is here. So you know that you can dig some amount straight down, but after that, if you want to make your hole deeper, you kind of have to slope the walls of your hole back. And that's exactly what this is. And we say that it's standard to slope at seven to 10, unless you get specific um, kind of uh, change from that from the geotechnical engineer. We can assume seven to 10. And we can usually dig straight down four feet in most soils without having to slope back. Thickness of a spread footing, a good rule of thumb would be to make your projection equal to your thickness, but um, I would always make your thickness minimum 200 millimeter. You wouldn't see less than that for a footing. Stepped footing, we talked about this in um, the first or second lecture, I believe. You can't just have a footing at this depth and then drop really far down to your lower depth. We transition it smoothly on the underside to get to that new depth. So if this is where your high basement is and this is where your low basement is, you can't bring that underside of footing here and drop down. Even though this is your underside of your high basement, you've got to stop, start dropping the underside of your footing here. All right, caissons are drilled piles. So we typically use these where the soil near the surface is not suitable for bearing or where loads are very heavy. We literally remove the soil in these conditions. You take the soil out and you put something in its place, usually cast concrete. Um, we get two benefits. We get the side friction of the caisson and depending on the soil capacity, we can make use of end bearing here. Um, remember when I was talking about Edmonton, and I said they do a different style of construction. I tend to see these um, kind of on the waterfront area where we have um, lots of fill material and we need to get down to good soil. Um, in Edmonton, they don't have great soil or their good soil is pretty far down and they have deep frost requirements and so they're not trying to put in a basement with deep walls. They do caissons quite exclusively as foundations out there, probably not for houses, but um, kind of any larger scale uh, projects, they tend to do caissons or drilled piles. And in Ontario, whenever I've done caissons, um, we've never been able to do build caissons. I think there's only one of the footing companies in Southern Ontario that has the build caisson that uh, machine. Can you please tell me in? I sure can, Marty. <laughs> What are you going to go watch, Duncan? I want to watch on my tab. I want to watch something on my tab. Oh, Daddy's going to work, but you can go watch your tablet for a little bit, okay? No. Um, 
he woke up at 7 o'clock, which is too early for a kid that was up until 11 o'clock last night. <sighs> um, so here, because we don't do a lot of caisson construction, we don't have a lot of belled caissons. The belled caisson takes away more soil at the bottom, but you can imagine you have to get the machine down there. Um, so for us here, if we don't have a special machine, this is the hole you have to dig. And so really you've lost the benefit of your side friction. It's not a great way to do it. What you need is a machine that cores down and then has a thing at the bottom that scoops out um, a little bit extra at the bottom. In Edmonton, for example, they do so many caissons that that is kind of built into all their machines. So these bell caissons, which seem unusual here, are ubiquitous kind of a couple hours west of us. Well, more than a couple, but you know what I mean. So piles. Piles are um, a pretty sturdy object that literally just has weights dropped on it until it goes down into the ground. Um, and then they attach more section to it and then they drop the weights until it goes down and then they attach more to it and they keep doing that until they get to the depth they need. Um, uh, you do a lot of this in kind of, um, kind of highway construction and uh, subway construction. Um, uh, but we will use it in buildings as well. In fact, what we'll often do is a cluster of them under one spread footing. But instead of being spread out over the soil, we're spreading it out over a series of point loads. So it's like taking uh, this footing here and putting a cluster of those piles underneath it. If we have bad enough soil, um, what we might do is actually remove all the soil and bring back good soil. Trying to dig down so far and then cast concrete to get up. If we have to maintain our seven to 10 slope, maybe you end up with most of the area being excavated anyway, and now you're casting your concrete really deep. Um, what they found is that sometimes it's just easier to take all the soil away and bring back soil that works to the grade or to the standard we need. And that's called engineered fill. Um, uh, so the engineered fill would go in to meet 150 kPa, and now our footing's not going down as far. Um, uh, I see this a lot in arena projects, especially where uh, the concrete is over a huge area, not with high loads, but they need it, the, the crappy soil just doesn't work. So I see a lot of engineered fill on kind of large community center projects. Um, what you can do is do engineered fill locally for small projects in bad soil conditions. And so here you'd excavate down some, but then you do a trench footing. So they basically just take a backhoe and dig it out for the amount they need. A helical pier is basically like putting a screw into the soil or when you take a screw and put it in wood. It is really loose and floppy all by itself. If you just stand it on the piece of wood, it flops around. Um, uh, and so a nail is like our pile. You hammer it into the wood. Our helical pier is like our screw. So you twist it down into the wood. These are great in um, bad soil conditions. Um, you usually need three of them under a single footing or a series of them under a spread footing. Uh, they're great for renovations. The St. James uh, Parish Hall that I did, they added stories to an existing building. Um, and it was also uh, had the problem that it was, um, it had been a mass grave site in the uh, Spanish flu. Um, while they were digging the church, while they were building the church, they actually used the, the hole they had dug as a, a mass grave site. So there were requirements for very limited disruption in the soil. So um, the existing foundation um, was excavated locally um, and then these helical piers were driven with special brackets that went under the existing footing. And these were put like at a meter on center to be able to take the additional load with very little disturbance to the soil. One other thing about these, they're 
The one downfall with these is that they're, uh, well, there's two downfalls. One is that they're um, a proprietary product. Uh, so they're actually designed by the installer. In some ways, that's fabulous that they take on that scope. The problem is, is that um, they can't know necessarily how many they need until they actually install them. They can have a pretty good idea based on the soil type, but um, it's, it's, it's like trying to screw a screw into different types of wood. If you screw it into pine, it's very different than screwing it into a hardwood. And they have a good idea of what the soil is, but they can't know until they get down into it. Um, and they actually read the resistance pressure that they're getting off of their machinery. So there is some risk involved for the owner in going with this solution. Um, I've worked with some great companies that do this and they're usually pretty bang on. A mat foundation is where you basically just take your whole building and put it on one big foundation. Um, this works really well in bad soil conditions where you don't want to go with helical piers or other solutions. Um, when I did uh, Tommy Thompson Park Pavilion, that's exactly what we did. The whole building is on one big slab that's slightly down below grade and it's, it's, a, it's, about, uh, it's about half a meter thick and it's down... Uh, it's not all the way down for frost, but it's been insulated and insulation goes out around the perimeter. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Um, so frost can't get under the foundation to let it heave. So it's still frost protected by four feet, even though it doesn't go down four feet. Um, uh, and so that was very highly calibrated now because now you can imagine unbalanced loads on that. It's like trying to stand on a flutter board in the water. You know it's really hard. If you put your weight a little bit to one side, it tries to flip. And so looking at the balance of loads over that mat footing becomes the tricky part. Uh, timber cribs, if anyone's ever been to a cottage, you've probably seen a dock on a timber crib. Slab on grade. Unmodified, they're usually used for interior applications. Um, so that usually assumes a heated zone. If it's an unheated zone, you're going to need to put insulation underneath it to protect it from hot frost from above. It's cast on a layer of clear crushed stone, which is in turn on native stone soil if it has enough bearing pressure. A typical slab on grade requirement for BR is at least 24 kPa. This is a wonderful exam question. The slab on grade bearing capacity is 24 kPa. That's what we need to resist a slab. So what does our frost heave look like? Well, it looks like this. We can, or this is um, a void where the soil's moved away and here's heave. So if this was an exterior slab, so an unheated area, we'd wanna put um, insulation down here so the frost can't come down through the slab because if this is an outdoor space the cold can go right through this concrete down to this soil. This is all clear crushed stone that's not going to um, absorb the or it gives room for the water to, to freeze and also to drain. Um, where uh, here then we put the insulation protecting this soil from freezing. Over here, if we don't want to go down four feet, we need this soil to extend some amount. And this combined distance from top of grade down and then extend it out needs to add up to four feet. When I started doing this in kind of the late 2000s, every building inspector everywhere fought with you about it. Now it's considered, it's even listed in the city of Toronto's um, kind of uh, guidelines as possible and reasonable uh, foundation construction methods. So here's that if this, if your depth of frost is some amount, it needs to equal this to this, actually down even to here. So you want to sum up this distance and this distance, and that needs to be over four feet. The alternative is um, if you don't want to put insulation under here, you can do uh, a void slab, a void formed slab. So you need an airspace. And this used to be what was ubiquitous. Um, uh, and so this is usually um, a cardboard 
material that has enough capacity to bear the, the, the liquid concrete until it's cast. And then moisture deteriorates the cardboard and leaves a void there. And the soil pushing up would be more strength than the slab could resist and the concrete would, or the cardboard would crush. So why would we need this frost slab? What's it doing? Well, if this is our um, kind of uh, building here, we need this to be, what we always used to do is just drop this down and your slab would be down here. Uh, so heave or settlement, it was no big deal. We dropped it. Now, reasonably, and as we should, be providing accessibility access. And as a mom who used a stroller a lot recently, I can tell you that it benefits everybody, not just people with um, accessibility issues. Um, so what we don't want is a bump here. All right, so that's, that's one part of it. So once we need this to be flush to meet that accessibility requirement, what happens if this, if this drops? We've got a bump, that's not great. If this rises here and our door swings out, bam, we can't get our door open. So we need this to be frost protected, even though it's an outside slab. So frost slab, whether it's an airspace or whether if it's with insulation underneath extending over some amount, we need a frost slab at major exit points. Okay, retaining structures, I'm just gonna go through quickly. Um, you can see here that this is a wall. It's kind of acting like a beam or a slab on its side. It's bending like this. It's supported here by the floor and here by the slab. Contractors that try to backfill before this slab is in have a wall that wants to tip over. So it either needs to be redesigned as a retaining wall or they have to wait to put the backfill in or they could brace it. This is a retaining wall that's cantilevered up. This one resists the load trying to push it over by just being really, really heavy. This resists it by, as it tips over, it the soil tries to push it this way. It tries to tip over, but the footing is so big that it's being weighted down by the soil that's actually causing it to tip over too. It would be like um, trying to stand on something that you're trying to push over. Your own weight is helping stop it from tipping over even though you're pushing on it. Uh, so these are just some quick typical proportions of retaining walls. I tend to find that architects draw these footings too small. So here's kind of a quick good guideline of what proportions you should expect to see. Uh, timber retaining walls can be done, but proper ones need um, a dead man driven back into the soil. Um, Duncan is doing yoga. <laughs> cosmic yoga? Did you put cosmic yoga on for him? He chose it. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, there's like this great co website or YouTube channel called Cosmic Yoga and it is fantastic and kids love it. Um, so here is a modular block retaining wall. So it's the same as the other ones. It's usually resisted by a combination of gravity and um, uh, uh, retaining uh, footing, but they're proprietary, so they're designed by the supplier. Um, and you have to have considerations like, is there a fence on top of it? Um, uh, so these would be designed by them, but you need an idea of what to expect. So you're not surprised by what they give you when the contractor hires them. And so here's what these can tend to look like. You've probably all seen these on the sides of roads. Um, gravity walls can literally just be baskets filled with stones or gabion walls. So shoring, um, what happens when we have a really deep hole we want to dig um, and it is um, uh, beside another building. So we can't, we don't have that luxury of excavating it back at seven to 10. So what do we do in those situations? Well, we start by digging down, we drive a bunch of piles. So we take those weights and we drive them down and we connect the steel as we go up and we keep driving it down and down and down until the depth we need is down there. Then we dig down four feet and we drop wood in between those piles. So that would be lagging. 
Uh, then we dig down four more feet and those all drop down and we put more wood in. And we keep doing that until we get down to the depth we need. And then we can dig caissons locally and uh, put our steel into that. So we, we kind of do it around the steel. Sometimes we might brace those piles with uh, a raker or soldier pile. So these would be our soldier piles, these would be our rakers, and the wood would be our lagging. And that is the end of the foundation lecture. So that was a lot today with a ton of information and not a lot I can actually test you on. Uh, so you'll see that this week's assignment is a little bit interesting. Uh, some of it is me just making sure you watch the videos. Uh, but because I do need to test you on something weekly, um, I, I have questions about um, uh, spread footings. So you've looked at those examples. Pay attention to whether I'm asking for area or dimension. And remember, bigger is better, but not too big. We want to be as close to the right answer as possible. But if we're going to switch something, it needs to be bigger. So too big, eh. smaller, not at all. Right on or just a little bit bigger is OK. All right. Uh, so uh, next week, we start with size and guidelines. And you'll actually be able to start to get some answers. They won't be the right answers, but you'll start to get some answers next week.